Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Simon Carney, for those people who've just dialed in this afternoon um, and who weren't here this morning, and welcome to the afternoon session of this APOST webinar on the surgical management of snoring and sleep apnea. I hope everyone's managed to get some lunch for people who were in this morning, um, and then we're looking forward to another interesting session this afternoon. Um, as you may have seen in the last few minutes, uh, the introductory slide has pointed out how to change the translation sessions settings for this first talk. Um, if you go to the right of the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a, um, a translation option. And if you click on the English um, component of that, you'll get the English translation. So um, we've got um, Yvonne, who's kindly translating from Smith and & Nephew, and we very much look forward to hearing Professor Zhang's talk. Um, it's, it's, it's very relevant to mention that uh, our contact from Smith & Nephew, who uh, arranged this sponsorship, was Mr. Tarun Narang, who I, I've known for many years and has been a good personal friend. And we were all very saddened to hear that, unfortunately, he lost his battle with head and neck cancer last month. Um, but he got us the sponsorship from Smith and Nephew for this meeting. Um, and I'd like to dedicate this initial talk from Professor Zhang in his memory. Um, he's done a huge amount himself to promote cobalation in sleep apnea. Um, and it's very fitting that Professor Zhang is giving this talk. Professor Zhang and I go back a long way. I had the pleasure of visiting him in Dalian many years ago, and we've um, kept in touch ever since. He essentially invented cobalation tongue channeling and invented the, uh, the positions and has, has researched them very rigorously. And we look forward to hearing your talk, Professor uh, Zhang, um, who's now moved uh, from Dalian uh, to Shenzhen. And we welcome you today and thank you for giving up your time on a Saturday. Jerry现在可以分享你的lecture了。好。尊敬的Simon教授,尊敬的各位同事,大家好。那么今天呢,我给大家带来的题目是低温等离子舌打孔术在成人的偶萨斯中治疗的应用。那么偶萨斯作为
，即是舌后间隙的狭窄。那么舌后间隙的狭窄，主要是由舌根肥厚，那么舌体的大小是病因的主要之一，或者是说它是病情加重的主要因素。在以往的治疗过程当中，我们往往都重视了舌根，舌根。那么其实舌体在偶萨子的成因和治疗当中。扮演着一个非常重要的角色。那么我们知道，九九年的时候，弗莱德门这个改良了麻麻醉科医生的这个茶馆难度的方法，那么提出了对于这个舌体进行分度的一些这个标准。那么它分一二三度。那么同时呢，它也对于三度舌肥大的患者。进行了 U P P 的手术，那么它的成功率只有 8.1% 那么同时啊，他又对这组病人进行了舌根的射频手术，那么成功率提高到 43.3% 43.3 减去 8.1 还有30多的这个成功率，那么源自于舌根射频，那么就是说舌的治疗。是提高 U B B 成功率的一个重要的因素。那么舌根手术的发展史，我们现在回顾一下，在过去的三十多年当中，我们对舌部的手术，主要是见于舌根部，包括舌根的减容手术和改变舌位置的张力手术。那么目的呢，就是扩大舌后会咽区的阻塞。那么传统的手术术式啊，对于我们来讲，它有很多弊处。那么第一个是损伤大，第二个呢是并发症多。那么大量的这个术后的患者出现出血、黏膜下血肿、呼吸困难或者吞咽困难。那么同时这个手术呢比较疼痛，手术的时间比较长。以往做一个舌根的传统手术，那么这个手术除了单纯的舌这个切除术以外，那么好多的舌手术都需要一到两个小时，或者是两到三个小时，而且这种手术主要是用于舌根。<咳>那么为什么过去的三十年当中出现了如此针对舌根的术式呢？因为舌肥厚，舌根肥厚，一直是被认为是偶萨斯的重重要原因之一。那么，同时它的手术难度比较大，那么没有一个令医生患者都满意的术式。那么，基于这个观点，我们设计了低温等离子舌打孔术。低温等离子打孔术呢，呃，一开始在澳大利亚把它写成是 Z C T 体，后来我们把它改成了 C C 体。那么舌后间隙的狭窄，主要是舌后坠、舌体大和舌根肥厚，不仅仅是一个舌根的问题。我们这个术式呢，从局限于舌根的手术，扩展到了舌体手术。那么，以往的手术对于舌根和舌体局部解剖的数据很少，那么往往。工具也不健全，那么往往就是使用激光啊，或者是其他的一些设备。那么这些设备往往都是有创的，而且是创伤比较严重。那么缺乏一个理想的手术工具。那么基于这一点，我们进行了舌的解剖数据的研究。我们利用了八具尸头，十六侧舌。进行了正常人尸头的舌动脉、舌下神经距离中线的距离和舌宽度的比值，以及距离表面的距离的测定。那么测定的结果呢？舌动脉和舌下神经的主干在舌盲孔前后十个厘米和距舌根、舌尖二十五个厘米处这四点中。那么距离表面的恒定距离为二十个毫米，即为两个厘米。<咳>
那么这是舌下动脉，舌下神经和舌动脉主干在舌体的相对的解剖部位。那么这个呢，是我们舌动脉的这个距离，距离中线的距离和距离表面的距离。这是舌下神经距离中线的不距离和表面的距离。我们看一下舌动脉和舌下神经，它俩是半形的。那么我们的结论呢，就是我们的舌动脉和舌下神经的主干，在舌内分布呢，这个是有一个比例的。我们把这个比例作为一种这个，可以从这个面可以看出来，舌动脉和舌下神经一般占零点二七加减零点一，那么这面是零点二六加点零零一。那么一般是 0.20 至 0.27 也就是近三分之一到四分之一左右。我们这四个位置上，那么这是我们的模式图，我们可以看到舌动脉和舌下神经在这个四点上的距离。这个是动脉，这个是神经，这是它的这个参数。那么舌动脉和舌下神经的主干在舌门孔及前后十个毫米，和距舌尖二十五个毫米处，距离舌表面的距离是比较恒定的，为二点零 cm。那么讲舌的恒静，如果我们分为三份，那么中央的三分之一没有舌动脉和舌下神经，外周的三分之一。也没有舌动脉和舌下神经，只有中间和外周相交的三分之一有动脉和神经的走形。那么这个部位比较这个危险，但是呢，它是在舌表面下的两厘米以下，是在解剖的这个情况下。那么我们看一下这个表面的图。如果我们打孔的时候，我们这三点可以在这个位置上。那么红线的区域是比较危险的。那么有了解剖的区域，那么我们设备如何应用呢？这我们就做了，一开始我们做了三十侧的舌体，进行消融时间。消融档位和消融不同部并位进行分组，那么以求找到一个打孔的最佳时间，就是消融的最佳时间。这是我本人，这是我们在屠宰场，这是我的助手，这是我们在把猪舌头拉出来，在它这个放血之前，把这个舌头拉出之后进行这个消融。那么我们消融的过程当中。我们得到了一个非常好的一个照片。那么我们在五档十秒的时候，我们可以看到我们周围的组织没有水肿，筋膜也没有这个崩解，那么组织消融的这个空间非常小。那么我们看到五档三十二十秒的时候，那么消融的空间比较大，但是周围的。肌纤维和肌膜都发生了崩解，那么同时还有碳化。<咳>那么只有在五档十五秒的时候，我们可以看到消融的空间比较大，周围的损伤也比较轻。这时候我们可以看到肌膜有一些崩解，但是我们没有出现水肿和其他的一些情况。好了，我们就把五档十五秒作为我们理想的消融时间。那么我们研究的结论呢，就是我们每一个孔的这个，这是我们即时消融的一个情况。那么即时消融中，我们这个孔，当时我们查最大的可以达到 1.0 的一个这个空间，那么半径呢可以达到 0.5 就是5个毫米。那么我们每一孔的最大的这个半两个半径的直径是一个厘米。那么我们消融的间距有了，就是要隔开一个厘米以上。
那么我们消融之后，究竟产生多大的消融效果呢？我们这时候我们可以这个进行一一个测算，我们按照圆柱体积来计算，我们每一针的消融的最大的消融减容量可以达到零七点七八五个 cm 的立方。如果我们对一个三度设备大进行七针的消融的话，我们可以达到一个五点四九五。cm 立方的一个消融，由此可见，消融的这个容积或者是体积是非常大的。那么，这是理理想中的理论数据，实际当中是达不到这么多的。那么，我们看一下我们传统的这个缩形手术，在我们《中华耳鼻咽喉头颈》杂志，就是我们《中华耳鼻喉科杂志》在二零二零年第六期的时候，我们张庆全发表一篇文章。他对舌根进行了一个长三、宽二、深一的一个缩形的切除，那么他切除的这个每一次的组织体积有多大呢？那么我们按照三分之一的表面积乘上高度做一个这个体积的计算的时候，他每一次切除了一个 cm 的立方。那么我们看我们舌这个西提的术式。要远远的大于舌部分切除数，那么好了，我们理想中的这个数字和我们现实当中一定是有差距的。我们把它变成减少了这个五倍，变成了一比一，那么我们这效果也是不错的，要比这个切除数的损伤和疼痛减少的很多。那么我们这个术式呢，可能就出来了。那么我们把这个蛇的横径分为三份，中央的三分之一和外周的三分之一没有重要的血管神经走形，那么手术操作就安全了。中外三分之一三的交界处最为危危险，距离蛇表面下 2.0 的范围是操作是安全的，要超过 2.0 以下是危险的。那么我们从这个。垂直消这个打孔和水平打孔上来看，我们的模式图就是这样。那么我们每消融一次，就有一定的组织的空间被我们消融掉了。那么我们就得到了一个减容。那么我们临床呢，对于这些应用，我们将等离子。辅助下的微源成型术与不同数的式的舌根和舌体的这个消融术相结合，治疗舌体肥大和舌根肥厚的偶萨斯患者。那么它的有效率呢，明显的优于单垂型 CUP 手术或者是 UPPP 手术。那么我们这里面主要是通过 PSG 内镜和 MR 的这个检查确诊。讲这个舌根肥厚的患者分为中、轻和重，那么按照弗埃德门的这个分度分为一到四度。那么我们对于三度的舌肥大的患者，我们采取了七针的方法；对于四度舌肥大的患者，我们采取了九针的办法。那么我们的这个舌三分法，我们就把舌的这个安全范围进行了确定。同时呢，我们对这个舌表面进行垂直消融，对于舌体的侧缘进行水平消融。这是手术的视频，这是我们把舌先用一个针缝上一根线，把舌体拉出来，那么可以减少舌体的这个黏膜下的损伤。拉出之后呢，我们要找到舌盲孔。我们看一下舌盲孔的位置，这个点就是舌盲孔的位置。那我们在舌盲孔前一个厘米进行第一针的消融。我们消融的过程当中，可以轻轻的晃动这个，呃，我们的这个电极。
。那么在这个刀头晃动的过程当中，我们的肌肉组织的消融范围就会加大。那么我们一定要利用这个生理盐水的作用进行舌体消融，而不是利用这个我们的力量把它插进去，而是消融进针。每一次消融是五打十五秒，那么舌表面三针，这是垂直进针。我们这水平针针，我们找到第二磨牙，在第二磨牙的这个高度，我们进行水平消毒，那个消融，消融的针的方向指向舌盲孔的方向。对，我们在消融的时候，我们的经验是尽量的进行一下抖动。那么第二针的时候和第一针要隔开 1.0 以上的距离。我们从这个舌体表面上，我们可以看到。舌表面的和舌这个背面，这个是有一个间隙的，有一个光滑面和这个粗糙面有一个交界点。我们进针往往就在这个交界点的水平进针是比较安全的好，我们的这个录像由于时间的关系就放到这里。那么对于这舌打孔的效果呢？我们澳大利亚的这个医生 Simon 和 s t u d 都进行了这个充分的研究。那么他们对一组病人，这个 s t u d 这组病人 26.72 的这个 AHI 的患者，那么通过舌打孔呢，可以回到了 6.49。那么 Simon 这组呢是 39.87 这个 RDI 的指数呢回到了 21.25 那么看来它的效果还是不错的。那么关于 CT 手术的注意事项呢，第一个要注意等离子刀头进针的方向和进针的深度。那么进针的深度一定要小于这个 1.5 个 cm， 那么过深容易造成舌体的水肿和出血。那么第二个要严格的执行舌三分法，在舌的安全区域进行舌打孔，避免损伤舌乳头，引起味觉的障碍。那么两个打针这个舌的这个两针间的距离一定要大于这个 1.0。那么打针时可以轻轻的晃动刀头，增大刀头的作用范围。那么打打孔的最佳作用时间呢是15秒。切记，这个在操作过程当中点踏，那么一定要是一直踩着。那么确定打孔点后，手持等离子的刀要稳，要避免刀头打滑，出现其他的副损伤。那么我们这有一个病例，大伙可能看到他的术前、术后的五十天和术后四个半月的这个舌后间隙。那么第二个病例呢？这是术后六个月的舌后间隙。这是术后九十天的一个患者，这是术前的，这是术后的。我们看这个舌后间隙，这个判若两人。那么我们这个患者术前，他是一个垂体瘤的患者。那么他在这个治疗前呢，应该说吃硬的东西都已经很困难。<咳>那么。这个患者呢，经过我们的治疗，这是术前，这是术后，这术后的情况，这是术后三个月的情况，这是术后九个月的情况。这是第二次手术，五十一天的情况。不好意思，那么这是术后一年，我们可以看到这个患者当时他是这个三度、四度舌肥大，已经回到了一度的舌肥大。
。这是术后 MR 的变化情况，这是舌后间隙和舌体的长度的改变。那么这个术式的并发症有哪些呢？第一个是出血，第二是舌体水肿。第三个是舌疼痛，那么有些时候出现味觉的障碍，那不是手术造成的，往往是手术这个压舌板压迫造成，包括舌体麻木，都是由于时间过长才会出现这种情况。如果我们手术时间短，那么不会出现这种情况。那么这种情况，大伙可以看到，这是我们用这个舌钳牵拉舌体造成的。我们现在用针缝这个舌体向上牵拉，就避免了舌黏膜下的出血。所有这些呢，是我们对于这个西医提术式的一个讲解。谢谢大家的聆听，谢谢。Thank you, Professor Zhang. As usual, your talks are always very clear and excellent. Yeah. The, we have we have a question from uh, Dr. <laughs> Marasami. Why do we start one and a half centimeters anterior to the circumvallate papilla? Isn't the tongue base more important to ablate?关于这个位置，我们进行了充分的讨论。那么我们的这个舌盲孔，就是我们舌界沟的这个中间点。那么界沟的后边就是舌根。那么前面是舌体。第一点，我们扎在舌根表面的时候，我们的舌根里面有
Thank you. You just got to hope you don't go there in the first place. Um, I would like to thank Professor Zhang again. Yeah, and, and, I, yeah, and I, I look forward to seeing you again soon, Professor Zhang. Yeah. Um, I'd now like to um, welcome Richard. Yeah, come on. Yeah. Rich, um, now we've got a pre recorded lecture for Richard, but I, I don't know whether you're going to give it live or whether you just want us to run the, the pre recorded one. Oh, hi, Simon. I, I'm going to give it live now. Oh, great. Fantastic. Well, Rich, Richard is um, certainly, along with Stuart, the two of them are the, the two um, most experienced sleep surgeons in Australia. And it's interesting that following on from Professor Zhang, both Richard and Stuart developed the Cablamo procedure, which uh, uh, was a, a slightly more radical modification of Professor Zhang's technique. Um, Richard has um, developed his own modifications of other people's transpalatal advancement techniques. And, and when we were looking for someone to talk about that aspect in this course, I couldn't think of anyone better than to get Richard involved. So uh, welcome, Rich. Thanks for giving up your Saturday and look forward to hearing you talk. Thank you, Simon. Now, uh, can everyone see that uh, screen? Looks good, sounds Hi. good. Okay, well look, thank you very much, Simon and uh, Bonnie and all the organizers of the uh, this fantastic uh, seminar. Uh, I appreciate you very much asking me to talk. Um, uh, as you heard, I'm Richard Lewis, I'm an ENT surgeon in Perth, um, and uh, my practice involves uh, head neck tumor surgery and, and sleep apnea predominantly. Um, and I'm talking today on transpalatal advancement. Well, um, transpalatal advancement is an operation which was uh, conceived of and first published about by Tucker Woodson, uh, who has spoken earlier today. Um, Tucker uh, worked, in fact, uh, with uh, Professor Fujita, and um, he developed the transpalatal advancement in response to um, failures uh, in patients who had gone undergone UP3 surgery to uh, control sleep apnea adequately. The natural um, um, th thought process of people that fail, when patients failed UP3 was that they must be obstructing down at the tongue base level or somewhere other than the palate. Uh, but this is not always the case. And in fact, a significant proportion of these patients will still obstruct up at the level of the palate after a UP3. He first published this technique in 1993 in Laryngoscope. In its um, first uh, uh, form, um, the, or description, the, the transpalatal advancement was uh, an operation that was performed through an incision on the roof of the mouth over the hard palate, uh, as you can see here. Um, it was described as a Gothic arch incision. It's an arched incision which uh, starts uh, quite anteriorly in the midline and passes out uh, posteriorly just medial to the greater palatine foramen each side uh, and then passes just posterior to the maxillary tuberosity. The flap is then elevated, as you see in panel B, um, and the mucosa is lifted up off the hard palate and off the, off the palatine aponeurosis. Then the soft palate was separated away from the posterior edge of the hard palate. Bone was then removed um, from the posterior part of the hard palate. And this would entail removing uh, the majority of the palatine process of the palatine bone. Then um, the palatine aponeurosis was uh, cut through and separated um, just medial to the pterygoid hamulus. Two suture holes were uh, placed in the uh, remaining hard palate bone. Sutures were passed through there and then through the, um, through the uh, palate, uh, soft palate, and the uh, soft tissue was advanced uh, to close the hole. And then the mucosa was replaced and trimmed and sutured. 
The key things about performing this operation are uh, the, the anatomy. Firstly, the, the, um, the palatine bone occupies this uh, posterior third of the hard palate, and there's a symphysis between the palatine bone and the maxillary uh, component of the hard palate. Now, laterally, um, the main feature is the greater palatine foramen, and uh, this is where, of course, uh, the greater palatine artery and nerves uh, exit. And for those of you that do head neck tumor surgery, you may have at some stage used a greater palatine island flap where the entire um, hard palate mucosa can be elevated and rotated based on one of these arteries. An often asked question regarding this procedure is, who do you do it on? What are the patient selection criteria? I think the following list is, are the key criteria. Firstly, the patient should have moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea. They need to have been offered uh, a device such as CPAP or a mandibular advancement splint. And uh, they've either been unable to uh, use the device or, or they have refused to use it for various reasons. I would not recommend doing this operation on somebody with grade three or four tonsils. It makes sense to uh, 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 choose patients that have either no tonsils or very small grade one or two tonsils. If a patient has grade three tonsils, it would make a lot more common sense to uh, perform a modified UP3 uh, because the removal of such large, to large tonsils uh, may well control their sleep apnea. Finally, the patient should have a narrow uh, retropalatal airway. And ideally they have uh, what is called a vertical soft palate phenotype. Um, uh, thanks very much for uh, Professor Tucker Woodson for sharing this slide with me. And this illustrates the point about the uh, palate phenotype. On the left, um, this patient has an oblique palate, palate phenotype. Uh, the middle panel, it's a more of an intermediate uh, palate phenotype where uh, there's a prominent genu or, or bend in the, um, the soft palate. And then on the right side, the, pa the patient has a vertical palate phenotype. These are the ideal candidates for transpalatal advancement. Um, this is, um, this is um, discovered on endoscopic examination with a nas nasal endoscope. Uh, I take uh, great care in uh, observing the phenotype of the palate uh, with the endoscope when it's sitting up in the nasopharynx. The genu, uh, which is this uh, inflection point in the soft palate, denotes or marks the lower border of the levator uh, palatini muscle. And that's shown nicely in this anatomical uh, illustration uh, the genu corresponds to about this point here, which is the lower border of the levator palatini muscle. This is another way of looking at the um, palate phenotypes. Um, the panel on the right, panel C, is the ideal um, candidate for a transpalatal advancement. They have a very vertical palatal phenotype and a narrow uh, retropalatal airway along the entire length of the soft palate. So patients that tend to respond well to UP3 are more likely to have the oblique uh, palate phenotype, whereas the failures of UP3 uh, tend to have more of the vertical palate phenotype. And once again, they're much better suited to a transpalatal advancement, which is usually performed in combination with the UP3. Now, on to the effects of the uh, UP3, the, sorry, the transpalatal advancement. Um, this operation uh, has uh, a, a great um, um, positive effect on the retropalatal airway cross-sectional area. It's, a, it's quite a powerful operation in its ability to increase that area and um, Lateral X-ray uh, and, and uh, 3D CT uh, analyses show that it can in, increase the retropalatal area by 320%. And uh, you can see a pre and post-operative uh, X-ray here. 
It also stabilizes the, uh, the uh, pharyngeal airway. It decreases the critical closing pressure of the pharynx by eight centimeters of water in many cases. And by making the critical closing pressure a lot more negative, it stabilizes the airway and will uh, reduce the um, collapsibility of the pharynx. So in its first uh, description, uh, once again, um, the, uh, the operation was done with this Gothic arch incision, often in combination with some sort of a, a, a modified UP3. Um, and um, early in my series of performing these operations, um, I encountered a reasonable number of oronasal fistulae. So I went back to look carefully at the palate anatomy and in particular, the vascular anatomy um, and the fistulae were due to the um, tip of the Gothic arch incision necrosing, losing its blood supply. And then thinking about the blood supply um, and about the two uh, greater palatine arteries, um, I decided to try a different incision, which I called the propeller incision, uh, shown on the right here. The propeller incision is a... Um, is a, uh, a propeller shaped uh, incision through the mucosa with a, uh, a, a midline incision uh, starting uh, uh, fairly anteriorly on the hard palate, going down the midline to approximately the posterior end of the hard palate. And then an oblique arm passes out each side, uh, just posterior to the maxillary tuberosity right out to the area of the pterygoid hamulus. Then mucosal flaps are raised uh, using a Frears elevator out as far laterally as possible. And I raise them right out to the greater palatine foramen each side. And that gives me a very wide exposure of the, uh, the bony hard palate and in particular the parts I want to remove. I then remove um, the uh, palatine component of the, um, the, the palatine bone uh, component of the hard palate, as well as on some occasions, some of the maxillary bone as well. But I preserve a, a thin bar of bone uh, posteriorly, still connected to the palatine aponeurosis. This bar of bone needs to be freed up by cutting through the bone laterally each side. The palatine aponeurosis is, um, is incised to, as it was in the original operation. And then two drill holes are made through the remaining hard palate to pass sutures, which go through these holes and then loop around the bar of bone and the osteotomy is advanced and closed. And the whole point of this uh, incision is that it respects the vascular supply to the hard palate mucosa and doesn't transgress it. Now this video um, is a, a patient with severe sleep apnea who is undergoing a modified UP3 and transpalatal advancement. They'd previously had tonsillectomy, so it was just a very um, uh, conservative modified UP3. Here I am making the propeller incision using the mono, monopolar cautery. Uh, with a needle tip down to the aponeurosis of the uh, palate. And you can see the silvery tissue there, which is the palatine aponeurosis. Um, that is exposed both sides. And um, then a Frears elevator is used uh, to elevate the mucosa off the hard palate. The mucosa is densely adherent. Um, and it can be quite difficult to elevate it at times, but with uh, um, constant uh, um, firm pressure, the, the mucosa will strip up off the bone. And this is performed both sides out as far laterally as possible. And I like to elevate it right up to the greater palatine foramen. So you can, you can feel the foramen very easily with the, with the freer once you get to it. And you, I'm about to now put a Frears dissector into the foramen and then I lever the flap out and I wedge the Freer against the Boyle Davis gag, both sides. And that um, retracts the flaps nicely and gives fantastic exposure of the entire width of the hard palate, as you can see. 
you can see the palatine bone and the symphysis between that and the maxillary bone. So that's the palatine foramen with the freer in it, and it will not damage the artery. Then the bone's removed with a cutting burr. I've already removed the bone with a cutting burr and kerosene punch, and I preserve the nasal mucosa. Then I divide the palatine aponeurosis here. It's very easy to see that. It's a lovely silvery tissue. And then um, I use some scissors to just um, tease apart any remaining little fibers of fibrous tissue that might be um, fixing the um, soft palate to the hamulus. This is done carefully to free it up completely. Next, I make the two uh, suture holes. So anywhere in the hard palate there, in the, in the maxillary bone, um, two drill holes are made. You need to be careful uh, to not drill too vigorously so that you enter the nasotracheal tube. Now the, 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 the little bar of bone that I leave at the back is still not mobile. And the reason for that is um, it is still attached to the, um, the vomer. And I'm cutting that now off the vomer with some scissors. Um, you get underneath the bar of bone um, still preserving the nasal floor mucosa intact and cut right through until it's absolutely free. Once it is free, it should advance without any tension and you can see how easily that little osteotomy is closed. The bar of bone advances very, very easily. Um, you can even um, resect a little bit more maxillary bone if you wish, um, but uh, Almost all of that nasal floor mucosa is preserved, which reduces the chance of a fistula. And now the uh, two sutures are placed through each uh, fixation hole and around the bar of bone and tied up to close the osteotomy. Finally, um, the mucosal flaps are placed into position. Um, you'll notice that there's a very uh, significant amount of redundant mucosa now because of the advancement. And this needs to be trimmed very carefully. It's important to not trim much mucosa, but mainly the thick glandular tissue, as you can see there. And the reason for that is you do not want to close this mucosa under tension. It needs to be free from any tension. So I trim the glandular tissue out and then the mucosa will close and tuck itself in quite nicely. The, um, Flaps are closed with um, Vicryl, um, and uh, I use Vicryl on a 5 8 needle usually, which makes it easier to pass the sutures. <clears throat> so in 2009, um, together with my then fellow Neville Shine, we published um, on a series of 60 Transpalatal advancements, um, and this was um, published in archives of otolaryngology and head and neck surgery. And um, I'll just present a couple of the uh, the outcome results from um, that study. Firstly, the um, the sleep study changes um, the the uh, lowest oxygen saturation. In the red dots is the uh, pre-surgery uh, lowest oxygen saturation. And uh, in the blue dots is the uh, post-operative uh, lowest oxygen saturation. And this, in this scattergram of the 60-odd uh, cases, you can see a strong upward trend and an improvement in, in the lowest oxygen saturation. And that reached um, statistical significance. As far as the uh, respiratory disturbance index is concerned, um, once again, the pre-op uh, RDI is in red and the post-operative RDI is in blue. And again, you can see a very uh, pleasing um, uh, downward trend uh, or improvement in, in the respiratory disturbance index. Uh, and this also um, reached statistical significance. In this cohort of patients, um, some of them had um, the uh, Gothic arch incision uh, but later in the series, um, I transitioned to the propeller incision. So for the overall cohort, cohort we achieved success in 63% of patients. 
The definition of success we used was the share criteria. In other words, the RDI had to be less than 20 events per hour, and the, it had to be reduced by at least 50%. So that was achieved in 63% of patients overall. 71% of people had improvement in their sleep study data. Um, and 35% of patients achieved a post-operative RDI of less than five. Further analysis of the group of patients that had the propeller incision um, showed better results. 79% of patients with that incision had um, success with 82% being improved and 48% achieved um, an RDI of less than five. The reasons for the uh, better results in the propeller incision group um, are uncertain, uh, but Probably uh, as I went, uh, uh, became more experienced with this operation, um, um, I uh, became better at performing it. Um, I think my bone uh, removal um, was a little uh, more aggressive and more thorough in the um, latter part of the series where I, I uh, used the propeller incision predominantly. In addition, the fistula rate was significantly lower in the propeller incision group. So on to complications. Well, uh, bleeding of course can happen, happen after any of the, these pharyngeal procedures. Um, we're all very familiar with post tonsillectomy bleeding and, uh, um, and deal with that regularly. For transpalatal advancement itself, um, Bleeding postoperatively related to that part of the procedure is extremely rare. In fact, I've never encountered postoperative bleeding from the transpalatal advancement. But if it's done in combination with a modified UP3, uh, I have had bleeding related to the tonsil beds. Velopharyngeal incompetence or palatal incompetence is a very um, big concern of many people when they consider doing this operation. Uh, back in the, uh, well, let's call them the bad old days of UP3, as it was described in 1980, um, palate was resected. Uh, fortunately, we have gone away from that now, and uh, most modified UP3 operations uh, avoid resecting uh, significant amounts of soft palate, but it's become more of a reconstructive and repositioning operation. In terms of uh, transpalatal advancement alone or in combination with a modern modified UP3, velopharyngeal incompetence uh, must be extraordinarily rare. And uh, in my series of patients, I've never seen it. In fact, I'm not aware of any uh, published uh, cases of velopharyngeal incompetence occurring after transpalatal advancement. However, most patients will get some of this in the first uh, day or two or three after the operation. Um, they're all warned preoperatively to expect it and anticipate it. Um, it usually resolves itself very quickly. If this uh, problem is persisting for, for more than a few days, um, I uh, get a speech pathologist to help them with some uh, swallowing exercises and as the um, uh, tone um, and function of the pharyngeal constrictors and the palate muscles in, uh, recovers, the incompetence goes away. Fistula can happen after this operation. Um, early on in my experience with the Gothic arch incision, I had uh, a reasonable number of fistulae, um, probably for a number of reasons. One, possibly the blood supply of that flap's not as good as the propeller incision. But two, um, early on, um, my um, mobilization of the soft palate was not as good as it now is. And sometimes the, the, uh, the palatal defect was closed under tension. As I said earlier, it's very important to have no tension at all on the closure of this uh, operation. If it, is, if it is tight or under tension, you're much more likely to um, suffer a post-operative fistula. 
Smoking, uh, I think, makes uh, a fistula more likely, particularly with the Gothic arch incision where the blood supply to the tip of that flap can be a little bit uh, poor. Um, Eustachian tube dysfunction is another thing that occasionally happens with this operation. The dissection through the palatine aponeurosis and deep to that to free up the soft palate so it advances, uh, that can disturb the eustachian tube function. And I have had a couple of patients who have had a middle ear effusion. Fortunately, these are temporary and they have always resolved without any need for a ventilation tube. So in summary, the transpalatal advancement is an operation uh, for obstructive sleep apnea, which may be indicated in patients with the following. They should have moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea. Um, they should not have big tonsils, but ideally grade zero, one or two tonsils. They should have a vertical palate phenotype such as indicated in the picture here, where the palate hangs very vertically from the posterior end of the hard palate. And they should have been offered CPAP or a mandibular advancement splint as appropriate and either refused to use them or, or been intolerant of them. The operation can be combined with a UPPP. And uh, in most cases, um, I do that. And I appreciate very much uh, you listening to my talk. Thank you very much. Thanks, Richard. Um, any questions and answers? Let's quickly have a look. Nothing there at the moment. Um, you, Richard, you said you'd never seen a um, nasopharyngeal incompetence. I, I unfortunately got one as a second opinion um, where it had been combined with a UVP, a UPPP, and a transcervical um, uh, tongue resection. Um, and the patient ended up needing a posterior pharyngeal wall rib graft, um, you know, performed by the plastic surgeons to actually close the VPI. It's the only case I've ever seen. Yes. Um, was that surgery all staged, Simon, or was it all done uh, at the same time? All done at the same time as a primary procedure. Yeah, that's uh, that's someone uh, someone with an AHI forty one in a slim guy. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I think performing aggressive open tongue reductions at the same time as doing that sort of palate surgery is is uh, ill advised. Uh, mm -hmm. Really, really, that should be staged, and it, you know, it, it may turn out that that sort of um, magnitude of tongue surgery is is absolutely unnecessary, um, but. Uh, um, yeah, that's. Uh, I think that's too much to do all at once, and um, you know, really setting setting one up for uh, problems like that. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I think with the appropriate patient selection and uh, just a more. I mean, like you said, we all get a bit more aggressive as we get more experienced, um, but we also know where to stop. Um, yeah, the other thing, Simon, is. Um, I really, uh, I really would would uh, encourage people if they are getting, um, you know, persisting um, villopharyngeal incompetence to enlist the help of speech pathologists and particularly early post-operatively because you know we all see it with all our patients, even with our modified UP3s. You know, the the pharyngeal muscles get uh, absolutely stunned and um, and um, and they get very deconditioned quite quickly, and and it can possibly prevent um, that sort of complication uh, if the patient uh, is uh, aggressively rehabilitated early on. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you're able to hang around for the panel. I know Stuart yes. value that if possible. Yep. Um, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome Julia. Um, Julia I've known since uh, her days as a registrar and then um, she went off to do a fellowship with Scott Magnuson um, in Florida, um, which, I think still is probably one of the um, the most fantastic places to learn robotic surgery, um, and has come back to Australia really as, um, as as Australia's now sort of number one trained robot surgeon. So we look forward to hearing your opinion on uh, how to use it in the sleep patient, Julia. Thank you. Thanks so much for inviting me to speak, and I'm just going to share my screen.
Great. Um, so firstly, thank you for organising this. It's really great. I've, uh, if the talks this morning were absolutely fantastic and I feel like I learned something every time I listen to these Doyen speak about, um, about sleep surgery. So in terms of robotic sleep surgery, um, the first thing I'd like to say is the robot is simply a tool that you use to do an operation which is part of your sleep surgery armamentarian. It's not special in any way, it's just that it's, it can make a particular operation easier to do. So um, just in terms of my disclosures, I do work as a proctor for device technology um, who distribute the robot in Australia. So in terms of the overview, I'm just going to briefly talk about um, the robot and how the robot came to be, and then go through the, the surgical anatomy that you need to understand when you're utilising the robot, um, how you'd select patients and then set up the room and deal with complications afterwards. So in terms of the, um, the, the genesis of the robot operation, it was essentially an offshoot of the Chabelle operation. Um, which was aiming to do something similar to what Chevelle did, but with lim more limited morbidity uh, because you're not disrupting the suprahyoid muscles or swallowing uh, because it's all done transorally. In terms of the robot itself, the, the point of the robot um, or the, the way the robot came to be was that it was designed by um, Department of Defence to, to be used in battlefield surgery so that you could do remote operations. Um, and then the interactions uh, grew out of that. Um, and the, the application within head and neck surgery really started in, from a clinical point of view in 2009 from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, with one standing O'Malley and then moved on to um, the then the application for um, sleep surgery came in 2010 from Vicini's group in Forlee. Um, it was just one second I think there's a few people texting they can't hear can we just confirm I can hear you loud and clear and I think we can can we just double check those people who are texting in is that still the case? Can, um, just got these messages. We're not able to hear. Yeah, I can just see. Yep. Uh, I can hear you, Julia. I don't know if it's it, something to do. It could be something to do with that that region. Is it coming from the same spot? Spot perhaps? Can can some, can one of you? Oh, you can hear the moderator. Hmm. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. I don't know what to do. Um, I think just keep going, probably, Julia. Uh, someone else is. A few others have said they can hear you, so I think we just keep going. Simon? Um. Yeah, no, I can hear you. I think the other thing for people who may have got a problem with their own computer is these are being recorded, and if, you're, if you've got a technical glitch and you can't hear Julia, the, 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 the video of this will be available to you afterwards. I'm really, really sorry for those who can't hear. Um, so the, the, I guess going back to how this, the robot became integrated into um, sleep surgery, it was initially in 2010 by Vicini um, and his group at Forley, and then it became FDA approved in 2014. Now, the surgical robot itself has gone through several iterations as well. The very first robot for device was the S model, uh, and then it's gradually improved in its dexterity and some of its manoeuvrability over time. And the, the, um, the XI model, which was introduced in 2015, moved the arms from being like a praying mantis type uh, configuration to coming down off the gantry from um, a ceiling, ceiling type picture. The latest improvement has been, uh, well, I don't know, improvement may not be the best word, but the latest um, device that they've added in is something called the single port system, which became commercially available in 2019, but is not really available worldwide yet. There's only a certain number of places that have access to it. Um, the other thing that's happened is that the SI model has now been replaced by something called the X model um, to make it slightly cheaper to, you, uh, to buy than the XI model. And it's, it's very similar to the praying mantis type configuration of the arms that the SI had. Uh, um, the, 
previously there were actually two models that were two robots that were available for transoral use so the da vinci model is the one that's most widely available throughout the world and then the second model that came into play was the med robotics model which um, was more specifically designed for smaller entry points so it worked um, it was the the entry into the mouth was easier um, the, unfortunately, med robotics has been a victim of COVID and um, will probably not be commercially available long term. So just in terms of talking about the single port model, the benefit of the single port is that it comes out through one single port um, and it's got a camera with three working arms. Um, and that they're much more flexible or manoeuvrable than the XI model and they're smaller. The problem is that the, the, the fact that they're smaller does make them flimsier and so it can be a lot harder in the, the oral cavity because you've got your surgical assistant in there as well. So if we're looking at the robotic components, we essentially have, um, the, there's three components. You've got the patient side cart, you have the vision system and you have the surgeon console. And all three of those um, have to be fit around the patient um, to, to be able to utilize the system. And the model that you can see here is the XI model, which is where the, the arms are coming off a gantry that's like a ceiling, which does make it um, easier in terms of positioning for the arms. The next components that you need to look at are the, the visions, the, the camera, and then the operating arms. So with the XI models, the um, camera is an eight millimeter model and it's available in a zero and 30 degree. Um, for the, um, the arms, you would typically use a pair of Maryland's forceps and a cautery uh, in the second arm. The, what you can see on the screen are the five millimeter instruments that were used in the, the older version of the robot. And unfortunately, both of the newer versions, the X and the XI only have eight millimeter instruments, which um, is fine, but it does make it more difficult and it's slightly less room in the mouth and you don't get quite as good wristed instrumentation with the eight as opposed to the five millimeters. The other thing with this with a robot is it's not just about the robot and the surgeon. It's really important to have a team that understand how the robot works because that's what really changes the docking time and setup time for the robot. Um, when it's used regularly, it becomes simply like another tool in the operating room, like a, bringing in a microscope for an ear case. Um, and the surgical assistant is vitally important and sits at the head of the patient because they provide another two arms in the surgery. So you've got the two arms provided by the robot, and then you have a suction and um, typically retraction that can be provided by the surgical assistant in two separate planes to what you can achieve with the um, surgeon console. What's really important with the robot is understanding the anatomy or the transoral inside out anatomy. Now, hopefully with sleep apnea surgery, you will not be encroaching on the danger zone. You should really be staying out of that with sleep apnea versus what you would do with for malignancy surgery. Um, but the most common, if you're going to encounter any vessel, it will be a branch of the lingual artery and it will be the, probably the dorsal lingual artery. If you're straying into the realms of the actual lingual artery, you are out of where you should be from a surgical perspective. Now, typically that um, I would usually control those branches with a combination of clips and cautery. One benefit of the eight millimeter Maryland's forceps in the XI model is that they're bipolar. So you have a bipolar in one arm and a monopolar cautery in the other, which is great. Um, the essentially what we're talking about with resection for the, with the robot is really a, a extended or a lingual tonsillectomy. And you can extend that with some muscular resection, but you need to stay midline to avoid the, the um, arterial branches in the tongue. And so if you stay a centimetre um, away from the midline on either side, you should not get, you should not get into any trouble. 
Um, when we're talking about the pathway of the lingual nerve through the tongue, it does change depending on how the tongue has been suspended or pulled out of the mouth, um, as we've heard from previous speakers, so I won't dwell on that. In terms of the selection criteria, um, I think the most important one is that the patient is non-compliant with CPAP and doesn't have any other alternative because I do think that you get potential for significant complications uh, with surgical resection of the tongue base from a robotic perspective. Um, the, the other indication is that you need to have someone who has a severe AHI but is not necessarily significantly overweight because you won't get great results if someone's BMI is tending over 30 or 35. Um, you need to be able to demonstrate that that patient does have a significant obstruction at the tongue base. The secondary thing is obstruction at the epiglottis, and I would um, a caution against um, epiglottic resection at the time of a tongue base resection. I would usually do that as a secondary operation if it failed. With the robot, you do have to get a lot of instrumentation into the mouth. So if they have any degree of trismus, it makes it very difficult. It also makes it difficult if they have retrognathia because the angles become much harder. If they've got significant lateral collapse, you, you're not going to be able to achieve a, a, a large amount by just removing parts of the back of the tongue. And the patient also needs to be aware that uh, you may not be able to cure them, uh, that you're, you may be able to improve them enough that they can tolerate another um, device better, such as a, a CPAP or mandibular advancement splint. Um, when we're looking at the patients that we'd usually choose for malignancy surgery or what makes it harder for malignancy surgery, that same set of things translates into sleep apnea surgery and can be um, broken down into these T's minus the tumour. Um, but the, the rest of them still apply in that you, you need to pick patients because if, it's really difficult sometimes to get access if they've got limited intraoral opening. Um, the, what I would usually use to assess a patient um, for if I think they're appropriate for this type of surgery is the Friedman tongue and um, the Friedman lingual tonsil grade. Um, I know that Tucker earlier spoke about the more classification. For, for me in this situation, I find um, the Friedman one to be better. Uh, and I wouldn't typically operate on someone from a robotic perspective unless they had grade three or four lingual tonsils. Um, so that would usually entail if they've got uh, lymphoid tissue that's across the whole of the tongue base and at least a centimetre in thickness, or if it's extending over the, the ep tip of the epiglottis. And I think it's in these patients that the robot really comes to the fore because you've got a large amount of tissue that needs to be resected. There's um, it, the, having four separate arms in the mouth makes a big difference. Um, and I think that it, it, it makes it more appropriate than other um, tools that you have in the armamentarium of, of, of sleep surgeon. So just to reiterate the type of patient that you'd be looking for, it's someone who's got large, low lymphatic lingual tonsils, because this is where you're going to be able to make a difference. Um, if you're looking at someone who has a high muscular diffuse tongue base, which is um, retroplaced, the, and you can see this patient is post-operative and still has significant collapse, you're not going to be able to make a, a big difference. So um, if we're looking at the predictive factors um, for who you think is going to get a response to robotic surgery, there was a good paper that came out from um, Lynn's team, Lynn et al. in 2015, and the major predictors of success were less than a BMI of less than 30, an AHI of 60, or absence in lateral pharyngeal, um, velopharyngeal collapse. And they came up with a scoring system, um, which effectively showed that if you've got low BMI, high a, low, low, lower AHI than 60, and no velopharyngeal collapse, you've got quite a good surgical success rate, that being again the share criteria for surgical success. Now, one of the things that's talked about a lot in robotic sleep surgery is the use of dice. I'll be very upfront, I do not do dice. Um, I think that a, uh, a dynamic assessment, a wake assessment in the office will often give you as much information as you need. I would usually only do a dice for someone who has failed all other management and um, predominantly to assess the epiglottis at that point as well. 
Um, so I think we've talked about that before, so I'm just going to skip over that. So when we're looking at the basic setup of the robot, you do need a bit of instrumentation. Uh, one of those is the gag that gives you access into the oral cavity. You need to have the robotic equipment. Um, you need to have something that you can help pull or suspend the tongue outwards. Um, something to protect the teeth because they they can um, get be they can get in the way with the robot instrumentation, um, and you also need something to suspend the gag from the side of the bed. So the the gags that are available, there are a couple of ones that are predominantly produced or that are mainly used for malignancy surgery with the robot. You've got the Med Robotics Flex again, which probably won't be available long term, but was good because it had an integrated suction. Uh, you have the FKWO retractor, which is in the centre of the um, centre of the picture. That was the one that was adapted by Weinstein and O'Malley, and it's the one that I most commonly use. And then to the right of the screen, you have the Lars retractor, which was um, created by um, one of the surgeons in, in um, Europe who does a lot of sleep surgery, uh, sorry, a lot of malignancy surgery, Greg Lawson. Um, the uh, what I was talking about the suspension is that you can, you can use a simple tonsil gag to get access and that actually works quite well if you're going to do a U triple P at the same time because it's much harder to get access for a U triple P with these types of gags but you can't use draffen rods for suspension you need to use a bedside suspension to remove that out of the, the field of how you're going to introduce the robotic arms into the oral cavity. In terms of the room setup, again, there's a lot of equipment in the room. Um, the, the way that you approach, the robot approaches the surgical bed depends on the type of robot that you have available. I would usually have the anaesthetic machine at the foot of the bed, have the robot coming in from the left-hand side, have the vision cart on the right-hand side, the scrub team on the right-hand side, and the surgical assistant at the head of the bed to provide suction and um, and retraction. If you have the XI, which is the gantry type arms, uh, you would introduce it at a 90 degree angle to the, the um, surgical bed. If you have access to an SI or an X, it would be introduced at a, a 45, a 30 to 35 to 45 degree angle to the foot of the bed, which allows you to get mobility of the arms. The next step is docking the robot. Um, I would usually have three arms in the mouth. The first central one is the vision endoscope. The, the two on either side will be the cauterization device and the um, retract and the Maryland's forceps. In terms of the dissection, it, you're typically removing the lingual tonsils from the circum behind the circumvallate papillae to the vallecular. What's really important when you're doing this dissection, and if you're combining it with a uvulopharyngopalatoplasty, as was alluded to previously, uh, is that you have to make sure that you leave the bridge of tissue in between the lingual tonsils and the palatine tonsils. If you don't, that's a really significant complication um, and is very difficult to fix. So the when you're doing the dissection, what you're really doing is an extended lingual tonsillectomy. So you're aiming to remove the lingual tonsil down to the muscular layer and then potentially removing some more muscular tissue from the central portion of the tongue. This view is the you've got a simple tonsil gag in situ and you've got the two, um, uh, the two working arms, are the cauterization on the right and the Maryland's faucets on the left in the photo on the left. Uh, you would usually start by making an incision in the central portion, the midline of the, the posterior tongue so that you can get an idea of where the lingual tonsil ends in that muscular layer. You would then extend it out laterally. And once you have a, a shelf, um, initially it's quite hard to grasp the tongue. Um, so you need to actually create a shelf superiorly so that you can then use the Maryland's dissector to push down and provide some traction. Um, typically, I would use the Maryland's forceps open, so it's like you've got a wider um, uh, field of traction to push the tongue down, and then you can dissect along that plane that sits in between the lingual tonsil and the, the muscular part of the tongue. 
it's really important not to denude the, the laryngeal surface, I'm sorry, the um, glottic surface of the epiglottis. If you do, you can at, um, unintentionally get um, an adhesion form in between the epiglottis and the tongue base. And in my experience, that's what gives people significant dysphagia postoperatively. So you need to make sure you leave the suprahyoid portion intact. Once, you've, um, once you have completed the right-hand side, you would then swap the, the arms, the working arms, so the Maryland's and the cauterization are swapped, and then repeat the same process on the contralateral side. Uh, this is the, the view that you would typically get at the end of the operation. Now, the, there's a lot of description of um, how you can potentially approach the epiglottis during sleep um, during robotic surgery. Again, I would leave the epiglottis intact initially. You do that as a second stage. Uh, and there's quite a good report that talked about using a, so denuding the surface on the, 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 the epiglottis, denuding again the mucosa on the tongue base and using a barbed suture to suture the, the epiglottis into a more forward position. So this is a video I made when I was on my fellowship. Um, the, in, in retrospect, um, this is not an ideal candidate for a um, tongue-based resection in sleep apnea. It's, this patient has a predominantly muscular high tongue base. Um, um, but you can see the general idea of what you would do with the, the robot. In this one, the powered instrumentation is a Holmian laser rather than the cauterization. That's no longer available through the platform. But you can see that there's, um, you've got the two hands, you've got one for suction, and then the surgical assistant can help to retract um, to allow you to get a better, a better plane and continue the operation. So in, how much would you need to resect? There was a, um, typically it's between about 10 and 20 mils to get a good surgical result. Um, the, the, if, you, if you're choosing someone with large lingual tonsils, you'll easily get to that. Uh, in terms of the post-operative care, the uh, initial description of using the robot, all of the patients were tracheostomized. Um, the, I, I, ha, I do not do tracheostomies in any patients, either for malignancy or for sleep surgery with the robot, unless they've been in suspension for over two to two and a half hours, um, or I'm worried about significant tongue swelling, which is very unlikely if you're not in suspension for an extended period of time. I found that if, if you're extending out to uh, you know, three hours or more in suspension, the tongue doesn't just get swollen. You get a degree of hypotonia of the tongue, which makes it much harder to extubate the patient. I would usually monitor these, these patients post-operatively in a dedicated head and neck ENT ward. Uh, if you don't have a dedicated ward, I would look after these in the HDU setting just because um, they can, the tongue can get swollen and you need and nursing staff who understand the post-operative needs and care of these patients. Similar to palatine tonsillectomy or any tongue-based surgery, they get significant pain in the post-operative period. Uh, the first one to two days does not tend to be significant. The pain starts about day three and day five to day 10 tend to be the worst pain after the operation. I would usually in the immediately post-operative period give them dexamethasone intravenously given a steroid intravenously just to decrease the initial post-operative swelling. I stop this and then I restart at day five to day 10 to get them over the hump. And I found that decreases um, calls or representations with um, dehydration. Regular pain relief is incredibly important. I would usually use regular paracetamol and a sublingual um, buprenorphine because they don't need to swallow the buprenorphine, it works really well. Um, Oxynorm can be, um, I found, can be very patient dependent. Some people get a lot of um, discomfort with Oxynorm because they can find it quite acidic. Uh, and then typically I do use ibuprofen because I think that gives them really good pain relief. I would often get a speech therapist involved early. The reason being that um, they will have dysphagia. The dysphagia will get progressively worse in the post-operative period, and it will usually take them about a month to return to normal diet, but they will start a diet day one post-operatively. In terms of the complications, 
The biggest one is bleeding. The intraoperative bleeding rate is fairly small. Um, the chance of postoperative bleeding is similar to a palatine tonsillectomy. You do not need a surgical robot to deal with any postoperative tonsillectomy, just a laryngoscope and a suction diathermy will typically be enough. Again, it's very rare in sleep apnea surgery that you should be going into the region of a major vessel. So it's usually just venous ooze. Uh, I do think that they get a degree of tongue numbness, usually from compression of the gag, and that would often get better within about a month to three months. Again, they get some change in, or in taste. That's usually fairly transient. Um, but I think the biggest complication afterwards is dysphagia. The, the um, initial uh, um, literature suggested that you had virtually no long-term swelling outcomes from a significant resection of the tongue base. Um, in my experience, I don't agree with that. And there was a good paper that came out in 2019 where it looked at one surgeon's um, overall, um, is, uh, overall um, case series of patients who'd had robotic surgery and about 85% of them had some very minor, not usually, change in swallowing. The most common thing that was seen on the video endoscopic assessment of swallowing was that they got residue in the molecular the way people talk about that is they often feel like they get a little bit of rice or carrot or peas stuck in there and they have to cough up and then swallow. And they tended to get early spillage into the supraglottis. So if they've got a compromise, any kind of compromise swallowing preoperatively, you will usually make them worse. And looking at the overall, um, the, the overall success rate for um, robotic surgery, there was a meta-analysis that came out this year that suggested that in the pool data that there was a success rate of around 69%. Um, again, that's using the share criteria, but also importantly, this is not simply tongue-based surgery. This is looking at tongue-based with um, often multiple other multi-level surgery at the same time. So I think that um, it, it needs to be taken with a little bit of caution. Uh, again, you just need to be very picky with the patients that you choose for this type of intervention. The other important thing I think to note is whether um, what, what ongoing role TORS will play in the upper airway stimulation era. I still think that there will be patients who it's appropriate surgery for, um, but we may find that there's less appropriate people in and that they should be heading down an upper airway stimulation route instead. And there's been a couple of papers, good papers that come out recently that suggest that um, people, if they looked at similar cohorts, that the people who have upper airway stimulation potentially do better. But again, I think it all comes down to in the same way with any sleep surgery, it's about picking your patients for this intervention rather than the, the intervention itself. Um, and so that's, that's all I've got. Thank you, Julia. Um, there's always some fantastic um, uh, talks and videos from you. Um, has anyone got any questions for Julia? I, I mean, like you, I, I'm, I'm, dem I'm sad about the demise of the med robotics. I think for sleep surgery, without the complexities of a malignant resection, it was great. Um, yeah. The other thing I liked about the med robotics was the ability to use another instrument at the same time because you were the surgeon. Um, so I, I quite like being able to use a coblator at the same time as a med robotics, um, even with an assistant. And it was, um, it, it was a shame. And of course, you, your assistant with the Da Vinci can, can do that, um, but not you as the main surgeon because you're on the other side of the room. You need someone who's trained assisting you. That's the thing that makes a big difference as well. Um, yeah. Um, any questions for, for Julia? Oh, the other thing I was going to ask about the Nurofen, I'm, I'm with you on anti-inflammatories. Um, have, you, have you tried Celebrex? I have. I don't think they get as good pain relief with Celebrex as they do with Nurofen. That's just my experience. Um, right. I've tried Cele uh, Celebrex and um, Melicop and oh my gosh, Melocopsy. I can't think of the other one. Um, Meloxicam. Um, and I, I really think that um, they do tend to get, because you can give them a smaller dose over a greater frequency uh, and they can control it more uh, when they take it, because I use it as a PRN dose. That's where I think that they get really good pain relief. Yeah. Great. All right, listen, thank you, Julia. Um, and I'm hoping you'll be able to stay on for the panel if you've got time, but we'd understand if you need to log out. Um, and it, 
It's, it's morning in Europe, and we welcome uh, Nico de Vries um, from Amsterdam, and we're especially glad to have you here, Nico, because we know you've had a, a, a little bit of a, um, a glitch health-wise, but it, it's nice to see you here. Um, Nico um, is, is being prolific at the moment in, in authoring textbooks and, and doing things. His first one on um, uh, on dice got published early this year, and the new the next one on it on the role of the epiglottis is in uh, in, in preparation at the moment. Um, and Nico has been one of the European uh, key opinion leaders on upper airway uh, stimulation, and uh, look forward to hearing um, what you've got to say to us, Nico. Welcome. Well, thank you, Simon. Uh, pleasure to be with you guys. I hope that you can see my. Uh, uh, slides. Uh, first, we need to put it all in this perspective. Uh, this is last week in Amsterdam. This is cycling distance from where I live and walking distance from where some of my staff members uh, uh, live, uh, Max Verstappen and the Orange uh, Army. This is uh, important, guys. Now, regarding uh, systems for upper airway stim, of course, the most experienced out there is with Inspire. We will be mostly discussing Inspire. The second best is Nixoa. We'll devote a few minutes to that as well. But there are also other systems. We have the Aura 6000, the previously from Infera, now Livanova, which is more kind of a tonic stimulation. There are uh, cardiologists uh, working on stimulation of phrenic nerve for central apnea, and the group of David Kent is working on stimulation of the ansa cervicalis. So all confirmation that it makes sense to put effort in stimulation, neuromodulation for OSA. Uh, the pivotal paper that it all started with is, of course, the, the STAR trial seven years ago in, in New England, and this has made it much easier for all of us to work with uh, neuromodulation. Uh, we now know that it makes sense to stimulate only the protruders, not the main branch of the hyperglossus. We want to exclude retractors and only include uh, uh, protruders, including C1, which is responsible for uh, movement of the hyoid. Uh, the INSPIRE system has three components. There is um, a stimulation lead around the hypoglossus, you have the IPG, the pacemaker, and the third component is the center lead between uh, the ribs. Few short videos uh, with all uh, neuromodulation. You will start with putting electrodes in the lateral side of the tongue for detection of uh, retraction with your NIM, and a second uh, electrode in the form of mouth for uh, the protruder. So both for Inspire and Nixoa, this is will, but you will start with. Uh, you will, with Inspire, look for the hypoglossal nerve, uh, 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 especially, of course, the protruders. And by turning the uh, nerve a little bit around, you will see that sometimes there's this very small retracting bench uh, next to it. And only when you have seen that you only have the protruders, you're uh, placing your cuff. Here, the uh, use of the NIM, so usually the, 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 the Higher up are the retractors, and the lower down uh, branches are the uh, protruders. And by using the NIM and looking at the, the signal, this is the uh, protruders, and this would be uh, retractors. And by listening to the sound and looking in the mouth and uh, the muscles in the neck, uh, it's a total uh, idiot proof uh, thing uh, where to put your cuff uh, around. Um, the cuff placement, the first few times that you do it, it, it is a little bit uncomfortable feeling. How, how vulnerable is the nerve with the, with, with the now about 8,000 uh, uh, implants that have been uh, placed? We now know that, that, that the nerve is not that vulnerable. And as far as I know, there's never ever ha happened any uh, irreversible uh, nerve damage with uh, placing the uh, cuff as long as you are uh, careful. So you put the cuff around it, you can do it with your naked, naked eyes or with, with a loop or, or uh, as uh, um, we usually do with operating a uh, microscope. 
Um, there are several tunneling devices uh, out there. Uh, they, they are all uh, good. Uh, so you need the tunneling device to go up from the highest incision in the neck to the second incision on, on the chest. And you can turn off from, from, from below to, to up or the other way uh, around doesn't, doesn't matter much. You, you can do it either on top of the, of the platysm or uh, um, at the other side of it. Uh, most um, um, safe is to stay up uh, at the upside of the platysm, but you, you, you probably usually see it, especially in patients with uh, thin skin. So it, it is better to stay under the, the platysm. So the tunneling device, and then you can uh, connect uh, the wire from the one uh, place to the other one. Third uh, incision is used for the um, for the stimulation for for the sensor elite between the internal and external intercostal uh, muscles. So um, uh, using the third incision in the beginning, this is also a little bit uncomfortable feeling. How do you know that you're not entering the pleural cavity? But again, as far as I know, that has not happened as long as you stay in, in the same direction as the, the rib, you are uh, safe. Um, then when you have put this um, sensor lead and you need to check it with an external programmer, how is the uh, breathing uh, signal? And only when you are happy with it, as, as shown here, you will put your, your shooters in, and if you're not happy, you have to reposition the, the, the sensor. Um, then the uh, placement of the, of the IPG, important to put the wires below the IPG. So when you have to uh, go in later for, for uh, replacement of the battery because it is depleted, uh, that you don't uh, damage uh, the wires. So, um, and the surgery now takes like one and a half hour. Uh, we do it in daycare. Patients go home the same day. They have no problems with, with, with swallowing or pain or whatever. Um, then the first few weeks, we do nothing. Then they come back after four to six uh, weeks. And then they are instructed how to use their remote uh, control. And they're instructed to start at low power settings and then... Uh, in about eight steps or, or so in the course of a few weeks that they come at, at the, the, the desired setting. And then again, a few weeks later, they will have their sleep study, the titration. And then in about 80% of cases, only one night is sufficient to, 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 to reach the, 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 the good power settings. Um, having said that, recently the a new implant technique was introduced. We now use two incisions instead of uh, three. It is a um, little bit uh, quicker and easier, and in theory, uh, lower complication rate because you don't uh, you have one incision less and you have one tunneling uh, less. So for those of you who um, are not doing it yet, but it will start somewhere soon. You will probably never do the three incision any longer, and you will do the two incision approach. So the, 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 the incision that you already have for implantation of the IPG, there you go through the pec major. Uh, behind the pec major, you will see also uh, see the internal and external uh, intercostal muscles. And in between, you put the sensing uh, lead and you put your sutures and uh, you, you look at, 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 uh, at the signal. The signal is just as good as it is with the, with the three incision. So this is what, uh, what we uh, do at uh, present. Now, um, all started, of course, with the STAR trial. And uh, in that, we looked into safety and effectiveness of upper airway stim and moderate to severe uh, OSA. And inclusion criteria at that time was an age between 20 and 50, CPAP failure, not too much central mixed apneas, non-positional OSA, we have other solutions for it, no complete concentric collapse at the palate during dice and be mice uh, be, uh, below 32. All those things are being questioned as we speak. Um, the results of the STAR trial at that time was a reduction of the HI and the ODI 
which was very comparable. So this discussion, what is more important is not relevant here because everything is, gets better and uh, clinically relevant improvement in the quality of life and reduction of the ESS. Now, we, uh, the STAR trial was published at 12 months follow-up, but we uh, published again at 18, 24, 36, uh, 48, and 60 months. We are presently looking into 10-year uh, follow-up, and important is that the results remain stable. They don't deteriorate in the course of time. Some uh, recent clinical uh, developments. Now, there are now more than 150 uh, peer-reviewed papers on upper airway stim. There's really a lot of research out there. More than, uh, more than 2,000 patients have been published about. There are more than 8,000 uh, implants worldwide as we uh, speak. And of course, we don't have time to dis discuss all those papers. So I want to uh, uh, talk a little bit about some recent important papers. First, the ADHERE registry as published in Larynchoscope uh, uh, last month. It is uh, still on, uh, only online by Maria Suena and others. And here we have looked in two different groups, patient with and BMI uh, below 32, MD 32, and 35. And what we uh, find here is that this is the total group. This is below 32 and above 32, and it is more or less uh, the same. So this confirms that BMI itself is probably not that important. It is more about fat distribution. When we have a lot of abdominal fat, that's fine, but it is about fat in, in the neck, neck circumference. And as long as you don't have uh, CCCP during dice, you're probably uh, good. And just as one anecdote, I have one private patient with a BMI of 37. And I told him, but you should have the bariatric surgery. I said, I don't want that. I want to have this inspire thing. And I said, you're not a good candidate because you are obese. He said, no, I don't agree. Uh, I believe when you perform a dice, it was a very intelligent man. And uh, that what you see is favorable. I'm going to pay for it myself. So that's what we did. And he's doing fine. And there are also other patients with higher BMIs who react well to upper airway stim as long as dice is okay. Uh, in this group, we looked into uh, patient uh, satisfaction and the uh, vast majority of patients are very, very happy with their implant. Uh, and we look into our own uh, series. Um, this is reduction of the HI and, and ODI. And uh, presently, we do, are doing a little bit better than in, uh, on average. I believe, to be honest, that in the beginning, we were a little bit worse than average. But with, with increasing uh, experience and better patient selection, you can improve your results even a little bit further. In the Netherlands, we have the Patient Society, which is very, very influential and, and important to have them uh, as a partner. And they told us, this HI viewers, that's all nice, but uh, we are more interested in uh, how satisfied patients are. So we did this uh, paper in their magazine about patient satisfaction. Uh, are you happy with it? How do you compare it with CPAP? Would you choose it again? Would you recommend it to family and, and uh, friends? How is your overall satisfaction? And again, most patients are very happy with uh, the outcome of it. Um, since this is a new therapy, a therapy the, and an expensive, the Dutch Care Institute uh, wants to re, uh, us to report every year again how it is going. And they recently concluded that upper airway stem in patients with OSA and CPAP failure is an effect, effective therapy. Uh, the most common com complication is a temporary treatment intolerance. There are no serious or reversible complications in the Dutch uh, series, and the results here are at least equal or maybe a little bit better than, than, than average. So this is important for us because it makes it a little bit easier to, to, to perform implants than in the beginning. Other a paper that we recently uh, published is about daytime uh, uh, PhDs. Uh, we have been struggling for years with uh, sufficient exp 
experienced personnel to do sleep studies at night. There are no, not that much people who are willing to do it. Many of them are young, have kids and don't, don't want to work at night. And when they work at night, they are not available for, 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 for uh, daytime uh, work. And then we had the problems with uh, patient admitted uh, with, with Corona. So we started uh, doing uh, titrations early in the morning. So one night of sleep deprivation, then we start with the sleep study at eight o'clock in the morning. Patients have no problem at all then to fall uh, asleep. Almost uh, all patients uh, had a very positive experience with it. They, 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 they have all sleep st stages that, that, that you uh, need. And only in a few hours you have all data that, that, that you need. So that is what we now do uh, to contribute to easier logistics and better work circumstances for sleep uh, personnel without jeopardizing titration uh, quality. When we look at results uh, after 12 months, the HI in such patients are not uh, different from uh, the conventional uh, night registration. Uh, Eric Kazarian has looked into uh, a patient with UTPOP failures. Uh, it's not a contraindication for upper airway stim. As long as there is not a severe palatal stenosis, they will do just as uh, fine uh, as uh, treat with naive uh, surgery patients. Uh, DICE, again, uh, important. Um, um, here we look at, at the, the palate and left side is a typical AP collapse, which is fine. One thing that you don't want to see is this uh, 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 concentric collapse, the CCCP. CCCP is bad news for most surgeries and, and uh, treatments that, that we have. So conventional surgery, outcome is less uh, good, uh, MAD treatment, but CCP is, is not good. Um, upper airway stem with, with just a unilateral um, uh, stem is not good. So for almost every week I will see patients uh, coming to see us because they, they want to have upper airway stem and they, they fulfill all other criteria and you find this CCCP and very disappointing to, to tell them uh, you are presently not a good candidate now. But what I usually then do is tell them, I don't care how you do it, but you need to lose five kilos, come back, see me again. We will uh, repeat dice and, and often then this uh, CCCP has changed into a better AP collapse and then you are a good uh, candidate. We come back to other uh, solution for CCCP in a few minutes. Um, all the paper was uh, uh, already about um, effect of upper airway stem on different sites and, and um, uh, Pfizer Sufuridin at the time from my uh, groups uh, looked in, into it. Here you see a uh, collapse at base of tongue level with stimulation off and here opening at that uh, side with, with the therapy on. But nicer already at that time was a complete AP collapse at the palate and re a nice reaction here uh, at palatal level as well. So where, where we in the beginning thought upper airway stim is good for tongue-based collapse, we now know uh, it works also in multi-level collapse and even in palatal collapse, uh, only the results of upper airway stim are equally uh, good. Recent paper by Huyet and others in Larkoscope who looked into DICE findings, uh, an independent blinded uh, reviewers using the vote uh, classification looked uh, into it. What they found that uh, good candidates for upper airway stem patient with complete palate obstruction versus none or complete tongue base uh, uh, collapse versus partial or none are good. And lateral wall collapse is less uh, good as uh, expected. Uh, now that brings you then to um, a kind of paradigm shift. Uh, I would say a few years ago in patients with severe OSA and during dice only palatal collapse, I, I would uh, recommend palatal uh, surgery. 
Uh, but to be honest, I believe that our results, with even with the modern uh, reconstructive palatal techniques, are not as good as with upper airway stems. So we dis discuss that with patients, and uh, we often now do not do palatal surgery first and embark on upper airway stem uh, directly in such uh, situations. Uh, there are some comparative uh, studies. There is a study by Mira and, and others. Uh, they have looked uh, into patients who were referred for upper airway stem, but who, uh, whose surgery was not covered. So they were then used as uh, controls and using uh, those two arms, uh, they could compare uh, uh, operated patients and non-operated patients, and as expected, they do, of course, uh, better. And it has been uh, compared with conventional surgery as well, and again, upper airway stem is uh, better. So this is Mira's uh, study, um, uh, uh, HI before treatment, improvement with, with upper airway stem, and also some uh, improvement in the controls. Uh, upward uh, uh, comparable in both groups, uh, increase in the controls and even an increase in the, uh, uh, the uh, increase in, in, in the controls of the, of the upward. Uh, the group from Antwerp has looked in, into endotypes uh, using the original STAR patient uh, PhDs. And what they found is that there's a better result in patients with a higher arousal threshold higher frames of muscle compensation, lower loop gain, and greater collapsibility. So it, it all comes uh, together. A, a paper that we're about to, to, to publish, but, but, uh, but we not have submitted uh, yet, is that we have looked in the ADHERE uh, registration in four different uh, disease, disease severity categories. So. Uh, starting here with moderately severe, this is HI between 50 and 30, uh, up to uh, um, 50, up to 65, and above 65 in all four groups, uh, you will see almost the same uh, reduction of the HI. And of course, uh, in these higher disease categories, the uh, increase, the, 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 the reduction of the HI is much more pronounced. So for, for us, this is very important because in the Netherlands, we uh, have no permission to perform upper airway stim in higher HI. So this is very frustrating that those patients with an I, HI just a little bit above 50 uh, are, are not um, uh, eligible and hopefully this kind of data we, we can use to, 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 to tell the insurance companies and care uh, institute that especially in those patients with, with a higher disease uh, burden, this is actually a good idea. Second system is the Tino system by Nick Sowa. Richard and Stu have much more experience with it than, than, uh, than we, we have. Um, uh, completely different uh, 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 implant system. You have the uh, implantable stimulator that you put in. Uh, at, at night, you uh, put this disposable patch um, uh, uh, under your chin. There's a charging uh, unit. Uh, surgery is therefore only one incision in, in the neck through a platysm and myelohyoid. Then you will find the genioglossus and genioglossus. You, you, you uh, stay in the midline and uh, below the uh, genioglossus, you go with blunt section under it on top of the genioglossus. You can again use the NIM. And then you put the implant in the, the antenna and the two paddles at both sides as, as a saddle on, on a horse, it's called. You can then use an external stimulator to check uh, how the position is, if, 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 if there a good uh, symmetric forward movement of the tongue and then you close the wand. Now, in, in my hands, I find that this a little bit uh, surgically challenging than the in Inspire uh, approach. Um, but uh, it, it is doable. Uh, there is some data about it. The, the, uh, the, the, the BLAST study, you, you guys in Australia, reduction of the HIF of around 50% uh, response. Uh, the, the, the paper that Peter, uh, our next speaker, and Stu and David Hillman and Richard uh, uh, published 
uh, about um, uh, the, 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 the second uh, study, again, comparable uh, response. Um, interesting is this better sleep study in, in CCCP versus non-CCCP uh, that makes absolutely sense to, to, to do this bilateral stimulation in, in those uh, cases. And uh, Richard has even this nice case report uh, about a com uh, very convincing reduction of the HI uh, with bilateral stimulation in a patient with CCCP. So I'm, I'm very happy with these results. And probably it's not necessary Nixoa that you have to use uh, in CCCP, but again, very good idea to do this. Future perspectives, as, as I uh, see it, so this uh, original inclusion criteria for INSPIRE are being questioned. I believe that in higher HIs, 50 and even above 65, it's still a good idea to do it. Uh, you, we, we need to abandon the, this restriction of BMI. Uh, BMI itself is not important. It's about fat distribution in the neck. Uh, we did, that, did not discuss patients with mixed uh, sleep disturbances, insomnia, which uh, might be a problem with upper air stem, maybe something for the panel discussion. I would love to uh, look into patients with a higher mixed and central component because the idea is, of course, when in such patients uh, you get rid of the uh, obstructive component in the long run, this mixed and central apneas may disappear as well, but at this moment that's more theory than that the proof of it. Uh, there are now positional uh, patients who have failed positional therapy and do good with upper airway stem as well. And combination th uh, therapy in, in very difficult cases is also a consideration. So in some, presently two systems, Inspire and Nixoa, but others will be introduced uh, soon. Others are very interesting in the early phases of development, such as stimulation of ansa cervicalis. And, and for me, it has always been a great pleasure to be involved in, in this uh, adventure. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nico. Um, as always, a fantastic talk. A um, couple of questions. The first one is, is there any evidence that with upper airway stimulation, um, that repeated stimulation of the tongue musculature raises tone to a degree that they might not need the stimulator in the future? Yeah, a great, great uh, question. Uh, yeah, the experience that, that we have is no, you, you need to keep uh, using it. So there, there is not, no, no. Um, uh, training of, of, of the tongue, uh, so no. Uh, um, other way around, in the beginning, there was, of course, uh, some uh, concern about hypertrophy of, of the tongue or, 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 or weakness because uh, you stimulate it too much, doesn't happen. So it, it, it works fine, but you, maintenance is, is important. Okay, thanks. And Stu, there was another question which I think you're going to handle about CCP. Uh, I think it was uh, questioning where did the CCP come from originally, but it came actually, and Richard might want to comment and Nico might want to comment, it came from an original paper, I think, Nico, on only, on only about six, five or six patients that complete concentric collapse that, uh, had worse outcome initially um, with Inspire implantation. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure, Richard and Nico, are we allowed to reveal some of the data that I think Nico was touching upon there from the... Uh, the Better Sleep study, which probably, Richard, I think is going to suggest there's probably not a huge difference between groups. You're, mute, you're on mute, Rich. Sorry. Uh, that's, that's true. Um, uh, both points. The, the original um, adverse um, results with Inspire and CCC were, were on very, very small um, numbers of patients. And... Um, the other problem was that the uh, the dice were non-standardized, so uh, different dice used different uh, drugs. So some used midazolam, some used propofol. There was no standardization of depth of sedation and that sort of thing. So, I mean, it's hard to really draw concrete conclusions from that. But nevertheless, um, that has sort of uh, um, flavored the whole uh, the whole thing with with uh, Inspire 
ever since then, and they, they don't, uh, as Nico said, in, implant people with CCC. Um, so the uh, Better Sleep trial, all of the implants are done, and we have six months data back, um, which I'm writing up at the moment. The results in the CCC patients are almost as good as in the uh, non-CCC patients. And the CCC patients, not surprisingly, tended to have somewhat worse sleep apnea. Um, and uh, despite that, um, the uh, success rate is, is, is fairly close to the non-CCC patients. So I think it, it shows um, quite a lot of promise for the, that, that uh, cohort of patients. Yeah. Yeah, uh, totally agree. Totally agree. I, I was involved in, the, in that that first uh, study, the patient selection, uh, and and of course at, at that time, we, we deliberately looked into the the, the very best uh, potential patients. So that was the reason for exclusion of CCCP. But I, I would love to 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 uh, do, do bilateral implants as well. I guess that's the other thing sometimes, Nico, that you see. And we, I mean, when we were doing Nixoa, because the uh, in some of the trials because the dice was being sent back for review in the United States, it was requested that we did a minimum amount of time for the dice. And this might be an issue with anaesthetics and, and the depth of anaesthesia and so on, but it was also requested there'd be a jaw thrust. And sometimes you'd start out with one plane of collapse, do a jaw thrust, and then yeah. allow it again, and suddenly there'd be complete concentric collapse. So you can potentially change the degrees and, and planes of collapse depending upon perhaps what you've done to yeah. the patient. Yeah. No, absolutely. We, we, we have the same with the Inspire patients. So sometimes you are not sure, are we going to call this a CCP or, or is it more AP? So then you send dice around to, to other dice experts and, and you not always have the same assessment and it makes all the difference. Yeah, yeah. we, we don't have anything that much better. So but, but I understand the, 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 the problem with the dice very well. Right. All right, listen, thank you, Nico. In the interest of time, we've better push on. I hope you're able to stay on and join us I will. if you could. Um, yeah. Our last formal speaker of the day is Professor Peter Eastwood. Um, we've just had several of his papers referenced uh, in the last 30 minutes. Um, so the, Peter's got a reputation of basically being the think tank of future directions in sleep apnea in Australia. Um, he's got numerous patents. Um, he's connected with lots of new technology companies. And hopefully he's going to tell us, you know, while we'll all be out of a job in five years. So uh, thanks for making time, Peter, and look forward to hearing you talk. Thanks very much, Simon. I'll just share my slide. Great. How's that looking? Is that all right? We've got you in your view um, with your next slide on as well. Okay, I'll just try and get back to the, the other mode. Um, most of them will walk me through that, how I change that. Display settings, maybe. Next one over. Uh, yeah, sorry, I just can't see where they yeah, are. The next one over, it says display settings. It's usually in PowerPoint, there's a If anyone else can explain more articulately than I can, I think it's in the display settings, the second one across, Peter. That's it, Peter, go to that one. Yeah. How's that? Oh. So just go to, dis go to display setting at the top where it says display setting at the top of your screen. Yeah, I think you can you can see it, but I can't. Oh, you can't see it. Okay. No, sorry. Um, let me just try this one. We've got at the top of your screen. Have you got show? Yeah. I can. So now at the top of your screen, Peter, have you got show taskbar, display settings, and then slideshow, or have you not got those three things? No, I haven't got that. Sorry. Um, Peter, if you go to the top of PowerPoint, if you go into the slideshow menu, is that better? Get out of presenter view. What? Yes, that's good. Yeah, great. Done it. <laughs> Sorry about that. But, um, Simon, thank you very much for the invitation to speak. 
Um, and uh, this is the title that um, Simon gave me, uh, which is, I, I thought was quite challenging, um, given that you know, every, every day we see new technologies coming out for uh, treating different aspects of sleep more broadly, uh, perhaps less so for sleep apnea, but regardless, there are, are lots of new technologies uh, we're seeing for, for treatment of sleep apnea. So I, I found it hard to choose uh, something to talk about in a, in a sensible period of time. So what I've done is, is chosen to pick on these three specific areas because I thought they related most to the, the, the content of this seminar series. So uh, transcutaneous electrical stimulation, intraoral electrical stimulation, and myofunctional therapy. Um, these are things that, that I suspect your patients will be asking you about. Uh, perhaps when you first meet them. So, so what I'm going to try and do is just give you an update of where uh, the most current, uh, most current information is about these three modalities, and perhaps where uh, where they might fit in um, uh, hypoglossal nerve stimulation uh, specifically. So, if we start with the transcutaneous electrical stimulation, this is um, a, a, a couple of diagrams showing the current state of the art for uh, transcutaneous electrical stimulation. And essentially, it's a, a couple of pads that sit um, under, under the chin, submental region. And you may remember some of the very early studies, which was done by Mickey and others, where they had about six or seven or eight even little small pads. So now, now this is where we've ended up with a couple of pads um, stimulating the submental region. Um, interestingly, the transcutaneous electrical stimulation is not just applied during the sleep. There are studies which apply it during the daytime. And the thinking there, perhaps, is that we're doing some muscle training. Um, but it does make the interpretation of these uh, meta-analyses and other reviews which are done a bit more challenging because they generally include both the daytime data and, and the sleep-related data as well. Um, when applied overnight, um, similar to the hypoglossal nerve stimulation, there are a number of different modalities that could be applied, including a continuous uh, constant stimulation or, or intermittent stimulation. Um, so these are, these are the most two recent meta-analyses that I could find, both uh, one published in 2020 and one 2021, um, looking at the effect of transcutaneous electrical stimulation um, on sleep apnea. So I just want to walk through those two meta-analyses, the first one based on 10 studies, 198 patients, and the second five, 87 patients. So, so this is the study uh, from otolaryngology head and neck surgery in 2021. Uh, from Boyan Buyun is the first author. And essentially we have a forest plot um, here, which shows that the, the average change in AHI in this instance of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven studies, which met the inclusion criteria for this meta-analysis. And the big kind of uh, shape at the, the uh, solid shape at the bottom shows the average effect of all these studies. Um, so what it showed was that there is on average a decrease in AHI of about 12.9 events per hour when you apply transcutaneous electrical stimulation. And again, a uh, combination of, uh, of daytime application and nighttime. Um, the, the effects on apnea index were less clear. You can see that that solid uh, shape overlaps with zero, meaning there's no, no change. So uh, less consistent effects on apnea index less consistent effects on arterial oxygen saturation, although a trend for improvements, and, and certainly um, not much of an effect on lowest arterial oxygen saturation level. Um, we also look at the um, Ratna Sarwan uh, review done in um, 2021 in Sleep and Breathing. And what they've done is looked at these studies which are, which are simulating transcutaneously, but only during sleep. And again, this is the same forest plot with, uh, with one, two, three, four, five studies. And the overall data showed in the shape at the bottom are showing that on average, the decrease in apnea hypopnea index is about 16.5 um, events per hour. Uh, they reported a, uh, about an eight, um, an eight unit decrease in oxygen to saturation index, um, but not much else in their paper. So, so I would say that based on these two studies, um, uh, which are all based on a large number of studies which are increasing uh, rapidly, is that we're, we're struggling to interpret this data because, because of uh, the combination of sleep-related data and, uh, and daytime data in a lot of the analyses. 
And I think what we really need is, is some more uh, solid randomized controlled trials where we have a placebo or a sham involved as well. Um, it's very similar, the, the, uh, the way that hypoglossal nerve stimulation has been developed and the way uh, this is being developed now in, in, we have yet to work out what the optimal settings are. For example, um, what, what, what is the likelihood of continuous stimulation transcutaneously having a positive effect um, on the, the apnea hypopnea index, or does it need to be inspiratory triggered uh, like the Inspire device? And we don't yet know what the frequency, waveform, intensity, location, and duration, uh, the optimal effects are, nor do we know uh, in transcutaneous electrical stimulation, which may be more important than, hyper, than hyperglossal, where we're working around the hypoglossal nerve, um, what the effects of neck circumference, BMI, skin resistance, and even perhaps upper airway shape are um, on the effectiveness of this therapy. Um, we, we don't know what the best treatment approach is, um, cause, because of this bit of confusion about where the data sits in terms of daytime, daytime studies versus uh, nighttime studies versus those which have potentially combined day and night. Um, and also we don't know what the long-term acceptance or uh, cardiovascular impact uh, of this modality is. Um, I think it's really interesting where, uh, where this sits in relation to hypoglossal nerve stimulation. We still have a large a large but, but rapidly decreasing number of non-responders with hypoglossal nerve stimulation, but we still want to improve the effectiveness of the, of the therapy in some cases. And we'd like to move people from responders to non-responders, from non-responders to responders in other cases. And I do wonder if there's, there's a potential role, um, adjunct role for transcutaneous electrical stimulation, both in predicting or uh, someone who may be a good responder to hypoglossal nerve stimulation, or perhaps even as an adjunct to hypoglossal nerve stimulation. So they're things which I think people are, are thinking about at the moment. Um, the other kind of uh, therapy I was keen to talk about was uh, intraoral electrical stimulation. And this is a, an earlier study using this modality from uh, Randerath in 2004, published in, Schle in Sleep. It just shows where the electrode sits. The mount, a little small electrode sat um, under the tongue, and there was a chin electrode uh, on the underside of the chin. So when it stimulated um, the tongue muscles, a lot of the musculature in between those two electrodes was stimulated. Uh, the reason you'll hear about this is because there's a company out of, uh, I think it's out of the UK, uh, which is doing a fair bit of this. And, um, and they've developed a, a pretty um, kind of sexy looking device uh, which sits in the mouth and which, um, which is linked to an iPhone, so it can, can be controlled by a smartphone, and which stimulates, if you look at the right-hand side, it stimulates um, both bilaterally, just under the, under the tongue, and also has two electrodes on the right-hand side at the end of it, which is stimulating at the top of the tongue. So they, they're using this device to, uh, to provide uh, what they're calling uh, muscle training, uh, so tongue muscle training. Um, the protocols are interesting. It's, it's a device uh, which is only being used to stimulate the, uh, the, fat, the um, upper airway muscles uh, during the day, um, usually uh, one or two sessions each day, uh, usually 20 minutes per session, where the stimulation is uh, bipolar, uh, phasic current. Uh, the intensity is controlled by the patient. And in fact, they use that, they use that smartphone to dial up the intensity to um, the maximum tolerable intensity, um, but uh, an intensity which is without uh, discomfort. Uh, they have an option for three low frequencies, anywhere between zero and 20 hertz. Um, the intensity is a maximum of 15 uh, millivolts, uh, which again is controlled by the patient. And again, it's used by the smartphone. Uh, generally speaking, once the therapy starts, um, it provides these bursts of stimulation, uh, which is approximately six seconds long, separated by four seconds of rest. And during a typical 20 minute period, um, the pulse frequencies would change um, every five minutes. So this is the protocol that's generally being adopted today. There's a whole bunch of different protocols that have been developed historically, but this is the one that you may be hearing about um, as patients hear about this. Applied anywhere from six to eight weeks. Six weeks is the current practice. Eight weeks has been some of the other ones. And these are the two most recent um, publications. 
uh, from Kachika in uh, uh, published in uh, 2021, and also from Baptista, also in 2021, both using that device I just showed you. Um, and this is the data from the Baptista study in Journal of Clinical Medicine, uh, looking at the effects um, of the snoring using an objective measure of snoring and also uh, partner uh, measurements of snoring. And what they found was that regardless of what the decibels were or the severity of snoring, there was a significant decrease in the percent of time spent snoring, regardless of snoring intensity. And, and I think very importantly, um, this, the partner also estimated that the snoring intensity was decreased. Uh, this is consistent with the Kachika study, which, which reported um, a partner uh, report of snoring was decreased with the therapy. But Kachika also uh, looked at, uh, I think they used a watch pat to look at um, some of the other measures, uh, objective measures of sleep apnea, such as AHI, ODI, if we're sleeping at school, all of which tended to decrease. But you can see that there's rather large uh, confidence intervals in each of those measures. So the AHI tended to decrease, oxygen to saturation index tended to decrease, and if we're sleeping at school, the daytime sleepiness also tended to improve. So that's where we are with, with intraoral electrical stimulation. And in terms of a summary of the current state, I think at the moment it's limited to uh, snorers and mild and mild sleep apnea. Uh, we don't know yet what the optimal settings and protocols are, although there's a lot of research going into it, particularly because we now have a commercial device which can be rolled out amongst different laboratories and facilities. Um, I'm curious to see what the rate of improvement is, because if, if the device is training uh, the muscles, then there is a, a kind of characteristic improvement in skeletal muscle function, which we've known from other skeletal muscles in, in athletics, for example, um, which I'm curious to see if the same rate of improvement occurs with these muscles. So, so what, what period of time over that six week period do we see optimal improvement in pharyngeal muscle function and optimal change in sleep apnea? Uh, we're desperately uh, in need of some prospective RCTs using this device. Um, the side effects appear to be quite minimal. Um, saliva production with the device in the mouth, a bit of tongue discomfort, but again, that can be dialed down um, by the patient. Uh, some, some studies have reported metallic taste uh, and filling sensitivity. Um, again, I do wonder if there is a potential adjunct role with hypoglossal nerve stimulation in people who are non-responders or those who were trying to optimize the response. Again, there's this, this multidisciplinary, multiple pronged approach to treating these patients, which I think um, many of the speakers have spoken about today. Um, finally, I'd just like to talk about myofunctional therapy. Um, there's a lot going on in this space, and I've chosen uh, two, two recent reviews which I think summarise where we are uh, quite nicely. The first one's by the Carrasco Latas, published in 2021, and also the, uh, another one from in 2020 from the Cochrane uh, database of systematic reviews. Um, again, the, the protocols with myofunctional therapy are really based on uh, many years of speech pathology, um, which which uh, are a series of exercises. Uh, designed to address specifically speech swallowing and growth issues, and they've been applied to sleep apnea. So, so while while they seem to be effective, they may not necessarily have been designed specifically for sleep apnea. And you'll see, and and you'll note that many of the current uh, uh, exercises are really designed more for sleep uh, pathology or speech pathology applications, such as to improve tongue position and function, lip seal, and nasal nasal breathing. Um, there's a bit of confusion about what um, is actually characterized as myofunctional therapy. Um, there's certainly the speech pathology techniques are myofunctional therapy, but sometimes you'll see publications which include things like breathing exercises, um, uh, the use of orthopedic devices, uh, singing and, and then playing wind instruments um, as also examples of myofunctional therapy. Generally speaking, the therapy requires the participant or the patient to exercise and do, do things to uh, increase the contraction force of the pharyngeal muscles between five and 30 minutes per day. 
uh, three to five times per day and anywhere from four weeks to six months, depending on the particular program. Um, I'm just going to show some data from those two reviews now. This is the Carrasco Latas review in 2021. And, and these are the conclusions that they came from looking at uh, doing a systematic review of their data, which is that there, there is a, a positive effect of myofunctional therapy in reducing sleep apnea. And they use measurements of polysomnography uh, and other um, a questionnaire-based uh, measurements of, of sleep quality. Um, they concluded that there was solid evidence for snoring reduction. Again, they measured that objectively with PSG and also uh, uh, subjectively with scales. Uh, they concluded that it was limited or no evidence to support the use of myofunctional therapy in treating upper airway resistance syndrome. Uh, they really had inconclusive evidence about the duration of any positive effects because they haven't looked at the, the follow-on period yet. Uh, there's no conclusive evidence about the, the protocol, which is the best protocol. And the available evidence indicates that uh, myofunctional therapy, although we're not sure about um, it, it, its efficacy uh, is safe with few and mild secondary effects. And I'll just contrast uh, these findings with those of uh, Ruder from the Cochrane Database Review in 2020, um, who, who specifically looked at studies that were of reasonable, reasonable quality. And they looked at um, studies which had a uh, sham versus therapy um, devour, uh, design. And what their conclusion was that uh, myofunctional therapy probably reduces daytime sleepiness, and there was moderate certainty evidence for this conclusion, um, that myofunctional therapy may increase sleep quality, although there was very low certainty uh, of this. And it may result in large decreases in apnea hypopnea index, although they only had one or two studies, which they could really say had any degree of certainty. So as a general conclusion, they said that that had very low certainty as well. Uh, may have little or no effect on snoring frequency. Uh, they were very uncertain about this. Probably reduces snoring intensity. There was moderate certainty around this. So in terms of the current state, there's a conflict between a lot of the reviews which have been coming out and that Cochrane review. And so I've just asked the question, why is that? And why is it the other studies and other reviews, whether it's a meta-analysis or a systematic review, are more positive? That's really due to the inclusion of randomized controlled trials in the Cochrane study versus observational and low certainty studies in the other kind of reviews. So, uh, so what this says is that we really do need uh, new trials in this area. Um, we need uh, trials in which the outcome assessors are blinded. We need trials which have increased sample sizes and also include participants and patients with different levels of, um, of uh, disease severity. And certainly we need trials with more women and children. But this is a really interesting area. And again, this is something um, which uh, could have adjunctive um, uh, therapeutic uh, effic efficacy uh, in combination with hypoglossal nerve stimulation. Uh, and also longer treatment follow-up periods are required. So my last two slides are, are just a, um, uh, something I think we're all struggling with and we're hearing more and more about, which is, um, how good is apnea hypopnea index um, as a marker of sleep apnea severity? And we know that there's limitations with it. Um, some of the earliest uh, hypoglossal nerve stimulation work that we're involved with um, for the company called Apnex, that, that showed that while there was um, a variable effect on apnea hypopnea index, there was a consistent positive effect on any other subjective metric that we, we measured. Uh, whether it was snoring intensity, whether it was perception of improvement, whether it was partner improvement. So there's this constant um, a disconnect between what we're hearing from the participants and the patients and what we're getting from the apnea hypopnea index. So there's a large body of work which is now being undertaken around the world to look at alternative metrics to apnea hypopnea index, including things like hypoxic burden, arousal intensity, uh, odds ratio product and cardiopulmonary coupling. I'll just refer you to that paper uh, just published recently by Atul Mahalter. I think it really summarizes where we are right now. And I suspect that we're going to be moving pretty rapidly to um, using uh, PSG, certainly, but also starting to wrap in um, some other interesting measurements, uh, such as genetics, blood biomarkers, um, machine learning, 
and wearables, perhaps, into, into, into diagnosing uh, sleep apnea and its severity and helping us guide what the therapies might be. So I'll leave it there. Thanks very much, Simon. Yeah, thanks very much, Peter. Um, I mean, it is, it, it's fascinating, and I think it, it's nice to see um, a sleep scientist <laughs> agreeing with the rest of us that AHI uh, doesn't tell the whole picture because I think you know we've we've seen that in the, the sleep surgery data for you know decades now um, where you know everyone's fixated including the you know the, the FDA and the TGA about you know you've got to get these patients cured um, and I think that's probably what led to us pushing so hard for Sam's trial to to basically be undertaken and published because when you're told that something you know works and the patients come back telling you how much better they are and then you've got um, uh, Adam Elsharg saying it's it's a limited clinical benefit, you know, it just doesn't fit. Um, any questions for Peter before he's got to rush off? Um, Peter, thank yes. you again. Look forward to seeing you when you get back in Adelaide and uh, do appreciate your time. Yeah, Simon, I'll, I'll just finish, finish perhaps by saying that uh, while I recommend RCTs as, the, as needed for some of these newer therapies, it's, it's not the be-all and end-all, because mm -hmm. as we know, many of the RCTs have such, such stringent inclusion criteria that they may not re represent um, many of the patients that come through your clinics. So it's, it's about getting a, a body of evidence around it, about the clinical impressions, and about doing good, you know, good RCTs as well. So that's where I think we need to head. Yeah, completely agree. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Cheers. And now, Stuart, over to you for panel discussion. Um, we're we're on time. In fact, if anything, we've got uh, an extra five minutes. Um, so uh, I'll let you kick off. And any other panelists from this morning? Or this afternoon, I, I think Derek's still online as well. Okay, we're ready. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Yep. Good. Uh, uh, look, yeah, and I think uh, I want to commence by saying thanks to Simon and to Bonnie for putting this together today. It's been a great um, series of talks and lectures, and far-reaching and wide-ranging from anatomy to surgery to non-surgical intervention. So. Uh, quite enjoyable. I'm going to take a slightly different tack to this panel than what we normally do. Uh, I hope that many of you who are present still to watch this um, and can pick up learning from it have picked up indications from surgery by watching the surgical talks by Ed Weaver, by Richard Lewis, by Julia Crawford. And I'm going to talk maybe a little tiny bit more about um, uh, perhaps those patients that maybe should not get an operation or should get other treatments before uh, they get an operation. So uh, this is this is Goldfinger from 2017. Hold the knife away from me, not closer to my neck. Um, so the, the real question here is which patient should we be offering surgery? That's one group. Uh, to which patient should we perhaps be thinking about surgery but sorting out many other sleep issues and non-sleep issues first and how do we prioritise those? And which patients should be probably avoiding surgery altogether? So my first case, just to kick this discussion off, is a referral that I received that states, many thanks for seeing this 30-year-old lady with moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea for an opinion on surgery as she doesn't want to wear CPAP long-term. So before I get into any more history examination, sleep study findings or anything else, just wonder if any of the panel members want to jump in and, and tell us how do you consider people as being appropriate for surgery just right off the bat when you when you, how do you consider uh, surgical options? I don't know if Rich or Nico wants to tell us from their experience what they're thinking already before they even start seeing a patient. Well, Maybe not. Stuart, um, can you hear me? Yep. Um, uh, well, firstly, um, as you know, everybody makes up uh, their mind about it or makes a decision before they've even uh, consciously thought about the uh, question and, um, and uh, will, will, will be so biased in their thinking, you know, uh, such as potentially this lady that they flatly refuse to use CPAP. Um, and um, 
whilst I must admit a person of that age is less likely than, say, a, a 60 year old to want to use CPAP long term, um, if they're bad, uh, if they're a poor candidate anatomically, then um, you know, the challenge there is to talk them around to at least trying it. Um, so sometimes I find myself um, trying to rationalize with these patient, people to sort of um, make them think a bit more widely and, and, uh, and set aside their biases and, and just uh, be open to at least trying CPAP. Okay, good. And I guess, I mean, Richard, when we did the randomized uh, clinical trial, we had these sort of criteria for patients for surgery, which was failing CPAP despite persistent supervised attempts to implement or not taken up when prescribed, or failed jaw splints due to patient refusal or lack of suitability on dental grounds or intolerance, or indeed never being offered mandibular advanced speech for entry to the, man, uh, the randomised trial. But I think you sort of encapsulated it quite neatly there because we're, we're trying to include what we believe with patient preference. And that's this whole issue as to who do we offer airway surgical options to? Is it just the failed compliance or tolerance of device use and those with significant complications of device use? Or do we also uh, consider patients who really favour surgery in their own mind or desire surgery, or they have particularly favourable anatomy for surgery without a trial of device use? So uh, I'll pause there just in case anyone else on the panel's got um, any further comment to add to that as to how strongly they allow patient preference to come into decision making, uh, how much the patient's anatomy will factor into that, where they'll put up perhaps barriers to patients who want uh, surgery and whether other factors such as uh, concerns about um, reasonable expectations or what else is going on in the patient's life might prevent you from offering them an intervention that they might strongly desire. Yeah, well, if I may comment from the Dutch experience, uh, we, we are in the fortunate uh, situation that we are uh, basically allowed to, to do whatever treatment uh, is out there. So probably the Netherlands is the country with, with the most reimbursed, oh, say, treatments that, that, that we have. Uh, so we are not forced to, to start with CPAP or with an oral device. Uh, um, so in such a situation, uh, I would, of course, listen to, to patient history, do a sleep study, then especially in such uh, treatment naive patients who consider surgery, we would perform a DICE. And then after that, uh, uh, all, all that workup, we would have the, the discussion with the patient. You have the following options, if CPAP, uh, an oral device or not, because uh, the dual thrust doesn't work or it, it, it is, is great. Uh, if you would have uh, considered surgery based on the dice, it would be the, the following uh, procedures with an estimated success rate of, of this and that, or you were positional, or maybe a, a combination of an oral device and positional therapy, or you are obese, you have to lose uh, weight, and, and then you come in, in a situation of shared decision making. And then, yes, some of those uh, younger patients, when they opt for surgery, I, I very well understand. But, but if, if you have an unfavorable dice finding, you have to tell them maybe you are not a good candidate. So it, it, when you do it that way, even when you would have a not fantastic result of surgery because of the shared decision making, uh, it, it is all good. You, you have given it a try. You have done your best. Uh, and, and as long as it, as it is their own uh, choice uh, based on, on, on your uh, assessment, uh, it, it's fine. So I think what Nico is getting at there, and I hope all of you can see the next screen that I've put up, is it's really comprehensive. You've got to take a detailed history and examination and go through a range, review the sleep study, go for a range of options, discuss all device use options and alternate surgeries, alternate treatments, horizontal therapies, clinical trial therapies, and so forth, and even include the fact that surgery is involved. There's a lot to uh, technique, technical factors. There's a lot to the preoperative and postoperative uh, treatment, and there's a long-term follow-up component to it. So simply, I guess, um, you know, as, as Richard and Nico have put together there for us, it's not just a matter of coming thinking about surgery up front, it's a very involved process and in some ways even more involved than other treatment modalities. And I'm just flashing up for you here, I don't think uh, Robson is still on, but Robson was involved in this paper 
uh, providing a detailed medical checklist based off um, uh, what they did was a, a review of papers, discussion points, and all those things and all those components that might lead you away from surgery if patients have them. And samples there are untreated insomnia, uh, issues with depression, central sleep apnea, hormonal imbalances, and so forth, without at least addressing those things or considering those things in the first instance. So I want to come back to our, our patient, our 30-year-old lady who's been referred to us, and rather than give you uh, the history and examination up front, I want to just provide a copy of her hypnogram because the referral comes with a sleep study, and this is the hypnogram that's been sent with it. And I wonder if anyone in the chat on the panel is willing to jump in and make a few remarks about the hypnogram. And I actually have Andrew Jones, a sleep physician that I work closely with, with me at the moment. And after the panellists have made comments, we'll ask Andrew Jones to make a few remarks about this particular hypnogram. Any takers on the panel? Well, it's a very strange hypnogram, Stuart. <laughs> that, was, I mean, that was exactly my conclusion when I looked at it, Rich. Do you want to point out to, to the uh, attendees why? Well, let's start at the top left. Uh, she's awake for you know, a couple of hours there, two and a half hours or so. And then she suddenly plummets down to uh, stage three sleep um, and runs along stage That's three. Stage two, I think, Rich, but yep. Stage two sleep. Sleep. Yeah. yeah, so stage two sleep. And um, in stage two sleep, she's got uh, profound oxygen desaturation and, uh, and snoring um, and uh, a lot of apneas there. And... Uh, a few high problems, but tons of apneas. Um, and then <laughs> and then she pops back up to uh, a little bit of REM sleep there, and she's actually better in REM sleep. And, uh, and so it's, it's a very abnormal hypnogram. And, uh, and then she, then sub subsequently, uh, in the very later part of the, uh, the sleep study, she's uh, sort of going up and down between stage one and two and uh, um, a little bit of REM and possibly wakefulness, but her airway actually looks a lot better. So something weird has happened in this woman's uh, sleep study in the middle of the night, and she plummeted down to this uh, terribly unstable airway. But but then in the very later part of the night, it looks a little bit more, well, let me say normal. So before I uh, get to the rest of the history, I might let Andrew Jones join in, but I think you nailed most of it there, Richard. Say, Andrew. Yeah, I think, Richard, you've... You done very well there. I'm glad that those talks I've given over the years have <laughs> been coming up. Anyway, no, I think it was a, yeah, very well described. Yeah, it's very unusual, isn't it, that uh, you see this uh, you know, prolonged latency to sleep followed by a prolonged period in what essentially appears to be stage two sleep. And that period there where you can see there is significant oxygen desaturation. The only other thing to say, you can see that she's in, on the second line there, she's in supine sleep for the whole period. Um, but uh, uh, associated with these desaturations. And then there's a prolonged latency to the first period of REM sleep, as you said, as well. Uh, you know, and then towards the end of the night, the sleep's a little bit more fragmented, uh, as you said, but yeah, I think very, very well described. So now on to a little bit more history when she walks through the door and I start to chat to her. I know uh, she actually walked into my room in a pair of Ugg boots and her pyjamas uh, during the day. <laughs> She starts describing, which wasn't on the referral, a chronic pain syndrome that affects her from the top of her head to her toes. Uh, she tells me she's been diagnosed by a neurologist with sensory autonomic neuropathy, which replaced the previous diagnosis of fibromyalgia. And interestingly, she's taking a range of medications on a, a daily and nightly basis, pregabalin, amitriptyline, which is an antidepressant, a combination of diazepam and nitrazepam from night to night so that she can switch her benzodiazepine, cannabinoid oil, and now trexone. And she tells me that it takes her anywhere from 60 minutes to four hours to initiate sleep each night because, quote, my nervous system is just always overactive. And I, she came and attended with a sister who actually happened to be a resident medical officer and said, when I sleep over in the uh, room next door, I can hear her making these weird and horrible noises uh, when she drifts off to sleep, rattling the walls, and they seem to occur when she's in the supine position. And what's interesting as well, even though she's seeking a surgical alternative, is she's been prescribed CPAP, is tolerant, is wearing it for seven and a half hours a night, although she tells me she's not asleep that entire time, 
and her control of any degree of obstructive sleep apnea is adequate on CPAP. So I might um, reintroduce Andrew and see if he wants to make some remarks about the history and the medication and how that might relate to the hypnogram. Yeah, so I mean, my thoughts are that a number of those centrally acting medications probably explain uh, the hypnogram that you saw and probably uh, particularly the benzodiazepine there's the uh, profound oxygen desaturation that was seen early on um, and probably later in the night once they're starting to get out of the system, uh, the, the less oxygen desaturation. Um, yeah, but I, I thought that those medications probably explain the majority of what was observed on that sleep study, uh, in, assuming she took those medications on the night of the sleep study, which I assume she did. So that's towards the end of the history taking. Has anyone on the panel got any other comments that they'd like to add, add now that they've got a little bit more detail about what's going on? Stu, I think this would be, Stuart, just going right back to your thing at the start about patient selection, I think the fact you've got Andrew in the room with you and you're discussing patients together, you know, it's, it's really important that your patients are seen by a sleep physician. And fortunately in Australia, they've changed the rules that the pharmacy PSGs no longer exist. You know, where we used to get these patients who'd been referred to the GP for a sleep study, they've gone to the pharmacy, got the sleep study, which had been reported by uh, someone who'd never actually seen the patient or even taken a history. And that's a recipe for disaster. So I think and if you've got a patient that's not prepared to engage in the multidisciplinary system, to me, that's a grade one warning sign. And that's the first thing I do if I haven't seen a sleep physician is get them involved right from the day dot. And I think for all the other um, doctors online in, in, in countries where that might not be routine, I would encourage you to do that. And I think the message you'll get from Stuart, from Richard, from Nico, from Julia and everyone is work with your colleagues. Yep, absolutely agree. And I guess what I'm going to say now is that moving on to the examination, and happy to uh, be critiqued by by uh, Nico or Simon or Rich or Julia or anyone else on the panel, but here's the summary of my examination. And many of you who know me know that my examination often goes for a page and leave out your patients. But my summary is the nasal endoscopy, endoscopy excludes any pathology in the airway, and with my awake dynamic manoeuvres, I can't induce any significant collapse. And the reason I'm keeping it brief and for that is because I'm not considering airway surgery in this patient. Whatever sleep apnea is being potentially induced by the range of medications and neurological and, I guess, psychological problems that she has, for me, uh, is leading me to just make sure there's not something else in the airway. Uh, and I'm unlikely to offer otherwise, apart from a detailed discussion with her about joint sleep position review, about seeing a sleep psychologist, seeing how much the sleep psychologist can do for her to bring this 60 minutes to four hours time to initiate sleep to bring it down to a much lesser period of time so that she can be weaned, if at all possible, off some of the neurological medications and the centrally acting medications that she's on, and then always happy to review, surveil, uh, reassess if there is any residual problems with obstructive sleep apnea after we've got to that point in time. But for now, that's where I am, and I don't know if anyone else would offer any different or anyone else has got any other comments about that? Well, in, in, in the Netherlands, in, in such a patient who has mostly events only supine position, we, we, we would start probably also with positive therapy and it would be reimbursed. That, that, that would be worth to give it a try as well. Okay. I think I'll move to the Netherlands. Everything's reimbursed over there. Yeah, yeah, that's easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, Anyway, so I hope that the points that we make are, are clear about this particular patient. And if you go back to the referral, which was, thanks for seeing this patient for, for about surgery, just take a step back, go through the detailed history first. In particular, the history is key. Don't get too carried away with uh, examination findings until that becomes an important point and try to work closely with others who, uh, you know, particularly if you haven't got a lot of experience with sleep physicians, sleep psychologists and others in that realm. So the next case I wanted to present is a 37-year-old aircraft fitter who only medical history is difficult to control hypertension. He, is, he presents as a loud snorer, snoring severity scale, which is a sort of a three-point scale, 
eight out of noise, nine with a gaspy noise between snores, and this was previously only common when he was in the supine position. It turns out that he's had some surgery to his airway by a previous ENT surgeon, and he tells me that since the surgery, he now snores both in the lateral and the supine position, whereas previously it was supine only. He has a little bit of restricted total sleep time, but not nearly as bad as the previous patient. He's not excessively somnolent and scores his equus sleep in a scale at 8 out of 24. And he explains to me that since the surgery, I feel like air is getting trapped in my mouth when I try to expire through my nose and mouth. And I'll just pause there. I'm not sure if any of the um, sleep surgeons on the panel want to make commentary about others that have they've seen that have had previous surgery and they get this kind of description from the patient, what the patient is possibly describing is going on. Before you even start to look in the airway, you can almost start to predict what they're trying to describe. I don't know if Richard or Nico or Julia or Simon want to make any commentary on that. But what was yeah. his previous surgery, Stu? I was busy trying to... I haven't, I haven't said that yet. <laughs> yeah, I, I would be guessing. I suspect this fellow had a uh, either... Uh, maybe laser surgery or perhaps an old-fashioned, uh, uh, very resective UP3, and he's got um, uh, stenosis, spilopharyngeal stenosis. That would be my guess. Yeah. So, yep, so 100% agree. Uh, some of these patients come in and they start to describe that when they try to breathe out or expire out, things get trapped, and it's usually a little indicator that there's some degree of velopharyngeal stenosis from scarring. And the further uh, history is that since the surgery, he notes food gets caught in various areas of his throat, particularly crumbs. And he also notes that his reason for his initial presentation to an ENT surgeon was not so much his supine snoring, but he felt my uvula was too long and I was panicking about it catching. So uh, not sure what they say in the Netherlands about that, Nico, but in Australia, we call that uh, globus fringius and we often link it to globus pharyngeus laryngopharyngeal reflux to give it the long-winded complex terminology. Yeah, uh, we do it and it, Yeah, and it does appear that rather than conservative measures, uh, this patient went straight to surgery uh, on the basis of what, was, what his history and examination was, uh, didn't have a sleep study or formal assessment, and may have been told that we're trying to improve this uvula too long scenario and some of your snoring. And so when I examined him, this is a video of his transoral assessment. Yeah, yeah. Very typical case, yeah. Yeah, this is bad. This is bad. <laughs> yeah. So I guess, uh, uh, Richard and Nico, um, I'm not sure if you're on this morning, but Ed showed a case that was even, uh, even, even looked worse transorally than this. I haven't got the nasal endoscopic view, but the nasal endoscopic view is markedly narrowed with tunneling of scar down to the midline posterior edge of the uvula where there's only a little bit of a pinhole of an airway. Um, and I suppose uh, the messages that we want to convey, um, I mean, Richard, do you want to make some comments about what messages you might want to give to people starting out uh, with sleep surgery around the world who are signed into this, um, this uh, Zoom meeting? Yeah, I mean, this, this is a, a really nice indication of um, um, aggressive uh, uh, palate resection. I mean, he has got a little neo-uvula still there, which is uh, better than some of these that I've seen. But, um, but the, it's important to not um, um, resect and shorten soft palate too much and to create a, a, circum, a circumferential scar um, it's important to reposition the um, the palatopharyngeus muscle anteriorly uh, to to anterior anteriorize the lower border of the soft palate. So, um, but the other thing about this guy, uh, as, as you've just pointed out, there was, you know, he didn't even really initially apparently seek treatment for snoring. He was worried about his uh, his long uvula and. You know, we all scope, uh, put a nasal endoscope into patients hundreds of times a month, you know, and, and look in lots and lots of uh, throats. And in normal people at rest, you often see the uvula sitting on the tongue. And um, look, he, he might have been uh, uh, worried about the appearance of his uvula. He might have had some sort of sensation related to it. Possibly, as you know, snorers, it's often a little swollen in the morning. Um, but 
to 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 leap straight into um, uh, surgery for that symptom um, is is very uh, uh, um, a dangerous thing to do, and it's uh, you need to offer patients simpler stuff first, and then he could have tried a splint. He could have tried if there were re was reflux treating it, um, uh, sleep, you know, positional therapy if he was uh, because he only only snored on his back uh, previously. Um, so all of that should have been done first uh, before subjecting a guy like him to, to uh, surgery. And, and uh, he presumably didn't even have a sleep study prior to his operation. He, he didn't. So, Nico, I presume under your care, he probably would have got a sleep study for the supine snoring. He would have had discussion of uh, conservative anti-reflux measures, avoiding throat clearing, vocal hygiene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Perhaps Discussion yeah. of a positional device if you got to that point after his sleep study where the supine snoring was an issue. Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's no way that that we even can consider surgery without without doing a sleep study in the dice uh, first. But uh, having said that, um, I, I'm more or less the proud owner of a whole collection of the, this <laughs> kind of palatal stenosis people because they are referred to us. And it is so bad for, for patients and, and, and for our profession and for sleep surgery. And it is usually yeah, caused by, by, by uh, inadequate uh, resection techniques. Hopefully the, the, the new reconstructive techniques do better. Sometimes you can help them with, with this uh, zetaplasty. You, you sometimes get it a little bit better, but, but you, you should not get in the circumstance uh, any any way that, that that you see such patients, it's always bad. That their 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 age is usually much higher than, than it was before. That we we don't need this. This is so bad. So, so Nico, uh, I'm I'm hearing there that obviously we think of prevention. Then I guess what do we do once it's actually happened? I mean, what if we got down the track, down the track, and we found this patient had a degree of sleep apnea. His symptoms became progressive. Snoring was a concern. He failed all conservative measures and all device uses. You talk. You just mentioned. I think. I think you're talking about a Friedman zetaplasty to try and widen the airway at least to reduce some of yeah. the stenosis. I mean, yeah. Richard, if we got any, if, if we ended up getting backed into a corner, we had no other options to help this guy. Uh, would you still decline any surgery whatsoever, or would you try to offer discussion points that might, in some way, alleviate some of his symptoms and possibly improve some of be snoring in airway with with revision surgery. Yeah, I, I think you know go through all of the conservative things as you said, but um, I, I would uh, I would try to help him with um, with uh, you know, scar lengthening surgery there, so a, a, a Z plasty. Um, and um, I mean, if it were really really tight, you almost need to re uh, to introduce vascularized tissue from elsewhere, you know, a regional flap even. Um, I've, I've used um, uh, FAM, facial artery myomucosal flaps very often for head neck reconstruction uh, uh, defects in the oral cavity. Um, it could, uh, as a, a superiorly based FAM flap can be uh, passed uh, just, just uh, posterior to the greater maxillary tuberosity and uh, could reach down to there. Um, you know, that would be in a, in, a, in a really extreme severe stenosis. But um, I think if you do a, even a careful Z plasty uh, either side, you're not going to make it any worse and you've got a reasonable chance of improving him. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and it, it, of course, <laughs> also depends so much on what, what kind of person is this patient. That There, there are patients uh, who are, are difficult to, to get satisfied and that probably it's better not to, to start uh, uh, on it anyhow, the, like in rhinoplasty. So you, the, the uh, yeah. uh, famous rhino, uh, rhino surgeons sometimes do not start revision surgery and say, go back to your own doctor because after I have done surgery, it may have improved a little bit, but not as good as you would like to have it. And then suddenly you're you my patient. But it is it, also a matter of responsibility. If you can, can, can have a, a reasonable discussion with the patient and you explain what the outcome might be and it, it, it maybe is not great or, or, or that you have any, don't have any guarantee but that you are willing to give it to try, then sometimes it's fine. 
but it will never be perfect. It, it might be a little bit better. Richard. So at, Richard. at the risk of repetition, I'm going to say detailed assessment. Look at those, you know, make sure that everything is in order. And if you aren't used to uh, this sort of work, make sure you work closely with a sleep physician or a supervising sleep surgical colleague and others in a multidisciplinary team context. Uh, was someone else going to make a comment, Richard or someone? Yeah, I was just going to say, Stu, I think Richard had a good point there about having other options. I think when you look at a palette like that and you're considering revision, if Nico's point is correct and you've actually got a guy that is is got reasonable expectations and isn't crazy, um, when you get in there and you get into that scar tissue, you have no idea what you're going to find underneath. You know, and therefore your plan A might not actually transpire. So you've actually got to discuss with the patient what the potential options to get rid of that scar tissue and move that palate further forward. I 100% I'd reinforce exactly what you said, Simon. Yes. I've been in this scenario once previously where I've gotten in there, we've tried everything else, terrible looking scar, and lo and behold, there was completely enormously recessed tonsil that you could not even see on transoral assessment or a weight nasendoscopic endoscopic assessment. The patient actually still had tonsil, which was completely uh, engulfed in scar tissue in a way. So um, you can get some funny findings when you get there. So the patient has to trust you and has to say, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to try and not, you know, maybe Richard would say, I may use the fan flap, but I may not. I'll try and do something else. And, and, the patient's not going to be hostile if if plan yeah. A wasn't what they ended up with. Had some plus or minuses on the consent. So there's one other thing, Stuart, that um, that would be worth considering in a very very severe stenosis. You know, when it's a, a sort of a, a pinhole type airway, there I have a couple of my head neck cancer patients who have um, an extremely tight and uh, and even one complete uh, cricopharyngeal stenosis post radiotherapy. And, uh, you know, we're peg tube dependent and with repeated balloon dilations, um, uh, which was against what I, my, my uh, cynicism initially, you know, managed to maintain uh, a much more open functioning, um, you know, conduit. And you could, a, a very minimally invasive, very safe thing to do if you wanted to, just to, just to see would be under a, brief anesthetic um, past one of the esophageal balloons and uh, under endoscopic guidance and inflate it and uh, stretch the uh, stenosis up and uh, just see if you get any sustained benefit. So the next case that I'm going to present is, I guess, in keeping with the theme of not just presenting cases where we say take the tonsils out, do a modified U3P, just to show a little bit of complexity because this is how these patients present in real life. Uh, this is a 72-year-old retired school counsellor who's been given a diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea. She takes a range of medication for osteoporosis and she has very, very variable sleep. One night she'll get into bed and not sleep till 1am, the next night she'll get into bed and sleep at 9pm and this fluctuates on a nightly basis. And so some nights she's getting three or four hours of sleep, on other nights she's sleeping for a total of eight hours. She actually presents wearing CPAP after her diagnosis of sleep apnea and says that she only feels minimally better, but both the patient and her daughter notes that she was a highly energetic person prior and wasn't really feeling particularly bad before the prescription of CPAP. And so I said to her, why, why then did you present for assessment of your sleep? And she said, because I felt restless and couldn't sleep well at night and was worried about my sleep. So actually, she wasn't initially complaining about any breathing symptoms, but more an inability to sleep well at night. And further detailed past history finds that she was taking no-dose medication to sedate herself to sleep some 20 years ago due to difficulty sleeping whenever she worried about her students that she was counselling. Uh, Equus sleep in a scale not excessively somnolent, uh, whether or not she was on CPAP. And at times, though, despite most of her issues being about typically sleeping, she is a loud snorer and could be heard as far away as downstairs and at maximum scored snoring severity scale at 9 out of 9, and that was one thing that has changed significantly on CPAP, where CPAP was controlling the snoring. The download suggests that she was using CPAP for seven or eight hours a night, but she was adamant that she was often awake during those, some of those hours on the download. 
And I asked her, why, why do you continue to use CPAP? Is it because the snoring is controlled for your partner or is it because of other reasons? And her response was, I don't want to die because of untreated obstructive sleep apnea. So I don't know if anyone in the panel wants to jump in just on the basis of the story that I've told so far and describe whether they see these sort of patients uh, and, and what sort of opinion or an approach they have to that kind of a history. I think it's really, um, when we look back at that talk that Robson gave earlier, it's that the patients that you need to or have to treat and the treat the patients that you might need to treat to make better. And if, if we're looking at this kind of patient, she, she needs to, I, I would advise her that she needs to see a sleep psychologist to some extent to work out what's happening from her sleep because her issue here is um, predominantly that she's having difficulty falling asleep um, and, and we need to give her a proper education around obstructive sleep apnea because depending on what she has, that, that's a completely false statement and it's unfair that someone has put her in a position where she feels like she's going to die if she doesn't wear CPAP. Correct. Remember, I haven't told you yet the degree of sleep apnea. I'm deliberately yeah. just keeping that up my sleeve for now. But absolutely. The question is, uh, you know, when we categorise these people and we think about their snoring and nocturnal symptoms, we think about their daytime symptoms and we think about potential risk like cardiovascular risk, motor vehicle collision risk and other risk. How do we marry all those things together into those paradigms that uh, Robson discussed earlier this morning of which ones need treatment and which ones might have treatment if it's so desired? And the other thing we've got to take into account here, Julia, is age. I don't know if you've got an approach to the 72-year-old who's lived her whole life very fit and healthy, only has a bit of osteoporosis and is very energetic as to uh, cardiovascular risk as opposed to whether we're discussing this same scenario in a 36-year-old, you know. Completely uh, different. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, what are we trying to achieve here, Stu? I think, you know, the, you get her sleep hygiene sorted mm -hmm. out. I suspect, you know, she may have moderate sleep apnea, but at 72 without any um, raised ESS, I wouldn't be too stressed by that unless she's got severe cardiovascular uh, morbidity? Well, I'll, I'll move on to the examination because I did do a fairly detailed airway assessment on her because she does snore loudly uh, despite being fairly low BMI. And I'm just going to give you one tiny snippet of the examination, which is an assessment of her uh, retropalatal uh, nasopharyngeal airway, which looks like this. Ooh. So I don't know if, uh, if uh, Rich, I haven't heard from you for a couple of minutes, whether you want to comment on when you see actual potential pathology in the airway, what, what you're thinking? Yes, yeah, so it looks like a, uh, a venous malformation um, on, I guess it's on the posterior pharyngeal wall, is it, of the nasopharynx? Yeah, I haven't given you great pictures and I don't have a video, but yes, it, it's probably projecting a little more significantly than what this picture tends to suggest. And yeah. my picture tends to suggest there's a little bit of airway here, but I think she was inspiring at, at the time when it te seems to genuinely, uh, genuinely compromise yeah. a reasonable proportion of the airway uh, during the nasendoscopic awake assessment. Yeah. So, so, I mean, this lady doesn't have the sleep ap apnea syndrome, does she? She's not tired and uh, um, she's got other sleep issues, really. Um, put it, my way of thinking about this would be if this were a child whose parent had brought her in with snoring and that was the adenoid, we'd take it out um, and perhaps the snoring would go away. So... Um, that's a significant um, reduction in her uh, nasopharyngeal airway, and I would be keen to treat that first of all and then reassess her uh, if the snoring bothers her. Yeah, and if the snoring bothered, if she wanted surgery, a treatment for, for, for snoring, would you, as a general rule, deal with that pathological entity first, Richard? Would you ever consider combination palatal or multi-level surgery uh, uh, irrespective of what the other findings are on your awake or asleep dynamic assessment. Um, I know Nico would probably do a dice on the patient and see how contributory other levels are, uh, or would you take it to the operating theatre with the intent of removing this and completing a drug-induced sleep endoscopy while she's under the anaesthesia if she wanted surgical treatment for a snoring? Uh, uh, look, I would... Um... It depends a little bit on what her sleep study shows, but I would be very unkeen to, um, you know, I, I just can't imagine her sleep apnea is terribly severe. Um, here we go. I'll probably be proved wrong now. <laughs> <laughs> no, so her sleep apnea, I mean, I, 
I, I don't disagree with the approach potentially. And, and for those that are, are unfamiliar, uh, Sher, uh, Julie referred to Sher earlier, and Sher's original meta-analysis from the 1990s suggested that up to one in 200 patients with a significant degree of sleep breathing disorder have some pathological entity in their airway. So they may have a venous malformation or they may have a thyroglossal duct cyst that dumbbells into the airway, into the follicular, or they may have malignant pathology. Um, this is actually uh, her hypnogram. And again, I suppose um, we might bring Andrew Jones back in again, but you can see, same as what you mentioned earlier on the first patient, Richard, there's a long period of wakefulness at the start of the night, which is not inconsistent with the story that we've got from this 72-year-old patient. And then probably a little bit of uh, uh, sort of not really relevant SATS probe falling off and on while she's awake. And then probably a range of mostly hypopnea without seemingly massive desaturation, but uh, a conclusion that was drawn by her treating uh, sleep physician with an AHI of 22 plus a few uh, rearers, Andrew, thrown into it, that she's actually a high priority trial of CPAP therapy, and that's where she's got the idea that I'm going to die if I don't wear my CPAP. So not sure if um, we might just introduce Andrew to comment on that and maybe comment on Comissa, the, the concept of comorbid insomnia and obstructive sleep apnea. Yes, I mean... I mean, looking at it, I think it's probably more moderate sleep apnea than severe sleep apnea that the report says. I mean, uh, you know, if you're worried about cardiovascular risk, of course, probably trying to find the oxygen desaturation index, which I can't see on that panel there, may sort of guide you a bit more in, in relation to this concern about cardiovascular risk um, in some way. And her age. And her age as well. And, you know, her, her other cardiovascular risk factor profile, you know, that's used in... Determining cardiovascular risk, established risk factors as to your overall cardiovascular risk, and from the history provided, there didn't seem to be uh, any other cardiovascular risk factors uh, that were described. Um, you know, I tend to agree, other than the snoring, there are no symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. Her clinical presentation is more of one of insomnia and some what sounds like suboptimal sleep hygiene that needs addressing. So, in these people, my usual approach uh, is you know, determine from the patient what they want to achieve uh, when, when they see you, you know, and if they want to achieve, in this case, I think is probably uh, achieving a, a, a better likelihood of getting off the sleep and staying asleep, you know, the focus should be with the sleep psychologist to improve that. If there are significant concerns about the snoring or potentially sleep fragmentation, nocturnal choking, potentially, uh, you know, focus more on the sleep apnea. But now there's data out there to suggest that in some of those people you need to treat both conditions, uh, you know, to get the best outcome. So I'll probably say that the update on this lady is, uh, or the way that we left it, she is going off to see the sleep psychologist. She is quite keen because it's been long standing and she's had issues and this fluctuating sleep from night to night. I did discuss with her that at age 72, probably the majority of, and being non-OB, having a good lifestyle, having no other risk factors, that probably there's not significant added risk whether or not she wants to continue on with CPAP uh, proton. And, uh, and that there is some data to suggest that uh, fluctuating or markedly restricted total sleep time or lack of sleep can actually uh, worsen such conditions as, uh, as might be associated with cardiovascular disease or even dementia. So um, she's gone off to see the sleep psychologist to improve that. She's going to consider whether she wants to continue on with CPAP. I've actually haven't seen it back yet, but I've organised some imaging for that area and I'm going to see whether that uh, venous malformation is stable or growing or not. And then we'll discuss potentially whether she wants treatment for snoring. And Richard, my plan had been, if she did, probably just to remove the lesion first before doing anything else to the airway and then reconsider options from there. But um, if anyone... Yeah. I agree, Stuart. I, I would, uh, if if you get to that point, I would just uh, um, remove the venous malformation. I, I use coblation for these, the uh, tonsillectomy wand works really well. And um, I've had some, a um, few patients with very, very extensive venous malformations right down all through, around their larynx and so on. And, uh, you know, the uh, the fear of uh, dealing with them down there is bleeding uh, and, and uh, not being able to control the bleeding. But, uh, a uh, flow seal is incredible in in these things. Uh, if you do get some bleeding that you can't control, you just inject flow seal into it and it stops it immediately. But I think with that malformation, and bear in mind too that um, you assess that when she was awake, but when they're asleep and they're lying supine 
and there's a little bit of negative um, um, intrathoracic pressure on inspiration that they can really swell up a fair bit those venous malformations and they can actually you know significantly increase in size. Yep, you're right. I think you'll I think you'll cure her by taking out that uh, AVM. Well, the snoring maybe. Hmm. Uh, probably the sleep apnea will be a lot better as well. Sure. So. Um... I, if we've got time for one more case, I'll present one more case. And there's, a, a, again, in consistency, in uh, trying to keep consistent with the theme of this panel, uh, rather than what I've traditionally done, which is always present a range of different outcomes, usually the good, the bad, and the ugly, uh, we'll get to one that might not be a perfect outcome and how it's been perceived. So uh, rather than the first three who hadn't had any surgery or intervention by myself, the next one ends up getting an operation. So this is a a 60-year-old chap with severe obstructive sleep apnea. I'll just give you the numbers rather than hypnograms or anything else. He had an apnea hypopnea index of 80, a mix of apnea and hypopnea, an oxygen desaturation index of 60. He had a six-day trial of CPAP where he got no further than 30 minutes on any night, uh, and it was under the supervision of a very well-known sleep physician uh, in our country. He wasn't able to return to it or could not possibly commit to it. He has a history of hypertension, hypercholesterolemia and depression. He's an ex-smoker of 25 uh, cigarettes a day for 30 years but hadn't smoked for the last 10 years and reported being a prodigious snorer, snoring severity scale of 9 out of 9, no current partner but significant complaints from mates on trips away and markedly elevated it to a sleepiness scale, although not on the category regarding micro-sleeps when he drives the car, and complains of waking frequently throughout the night for unknown reasons. So very hard for him personally to clarify whether he's waking from his own snoring, waking from gassing and choking, waking because he's got thoughts or other issues running through his head, or waking to get up to go to the toilet. So non-specific waking throughout the night. His examination, the basics of his examination were size one, small tonsil, bulky Friedman tongue grade three with lateral striation. And depending on how you do your dynamic assessment, his velum demonstrated a combination of AP flutter and lateral muscular wall collapse. And I think, uh, Nico, I find it very difficult to uh, separate that out from true concentric because actually if you've got a combination of AP and lateral wall collapse in an airway model, it'll look in some ways like concentric collapse, although sometimes it's a little different than a true uh, spiralling circle that closes in. He had lateral muscular wall collapse at his oropharynx and the appearances at the back of the tongue was a very bulky posterior third of tongue, dominant AP collapse in the supine uh, position secondary to that tongue bolt rather than epiglottis or any other structures and some modest improvement but only at the retrolingual segment with jaw thrust. So I don't know if, uh, if Nico or Richard or Julia or anyone else on the panel or Simon wants to make any comments about that history and that examination. What's his BMI, Stu? His BMI is 31, uh, 98 kilograms. Stu, so was the, the posterior base of tongue, was it a uh, muscular tongue or lingual tonsil? Uh, no lingual tonsil or bulk of tongue, Julia, so all muscular and, and tongue. He's not a good, he's not a good winner, is he? Um, he's, um, I mean, he, he's someone I'd imagine Nico would be looking at uh, hypoglossal nerve stimulation if he was allowed to. Yeah. Um, well, the, the, for me, the, the, these uh, kind of patients with an HI of 80, um, my result with multilateral surgery in such high HIs is not good. So I would not do that. I, I've stopped uh, uh, doing uh, multilateral surgery in patients with an HI above 50 or so. Uh, now, hypoglossal nerve stimulation, uh, HI 80, uh, yeah, the, the, there is no approval for it but you could give it a try. Maybe I would refer such a patient to a macrofacial surgeon. That's what we often do in, in very severe cases. And, and we, we don't have access to the robot. So otherwise that could be an idea as well. But um, I, I usually you see it in patients with a bit, bit higher BMIs, but 31 is actually not that bad. It's, so, just, um, it's not got a blocked nose or horrible polyps, and that's why he's not using his CPAP or anything stupid like that. Not at all. Clear and patent nasal airway. 
And I noted in my letter, after a long and detailed discussion for over an hour in the consultation, the patient was against any other treatment option apart from surgery, and I actually listed them out in point form for his referring general practitioner and sleep physician, including refusal of trial of mandibular advancement, refusal to try any other types or variations of CPAP, uh, refusal to undergo a referral for clinical trial participation for nerve stimulation or anything else, and refusal to see a maxillofacial surgeon and was significantly oriented towards surgery. So, uh, Richard, I don't know if you've got any comments about where you might go from here. Um, yeah, a couple of things. Um, firstly, I probably want to get a bit more detail about why he really failed CPAP. You know, how hard did he work at it? Uh, how good was the, the uh, support he had? How many masks he tried? You know, what were the issues there? A uh, good point Simon made, made is he got nasal obstruction, which made the CPAP difficult to use. Secondly, I would say to this guy, by looking at your, your treatment, uh, your um, uh, clinical examination description, I think it's really unlikely that conventional pharyngeal surgery is going to adequately control his sleep apnea. I'd make that absolutely clear to him. And I would say that if he wants to get good control of his sleep apnea, part of that is almost certainly going to involve hypoglossal nerve stimulation in combination probably with some other surgery. And he, if his sleep apnea is too severe to get into any trials uh, currently available uh, for um, hypoglossal nerve stimulation. And, and uh, as Nico said, even if he were in Europe, you know, he'd be too severe for Inspire. But um, this little anecdotal experience, uh, uh, I had a woman in the first uh, trial of the Nixora implant who had an AHI of about 100. So she was too severe to get into our trial. She had multi-level obstruction, terrible, terrible airway at all levels. And um, I uh, performed uh, palatal advancement and UP3 on her and reduced her um, apnea hypopnea index down to the mid 40s. And then she was able to then um, get into the uh, first trial, the blast OSA trial and the stimulator. I mean, at rest, this lady had a tongue sitting against the posterior pharyngeal wall, barely able to, able to breathe when upright and awake. And um, the stimulator controlled her, her retrolingual airway very nicely. So um, he's probably going to need combination therapy, but um, you know this is a patient by the sound of it who is very single-minded. He's done a bit of research, probably uh, he's looked on Google as they often say, and has made his mind up about what he wants to do. Um, but um, I think uh, I think it's uh, your job to 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 explain the uh, complexities of this situation to him. Then it's not just a uh, a matter of walking into hospital, having an operation, and you're fixed, and you can get on with your life. It's not that simple, especially with a BMI of 32. Because he's 31. Yeah, 31. I mean, I'd still be selling him up for some weight loss as a commitment before you'd even start having discussions with him again. So actually, uh, this went on to another consult and two telephone calls, uh, and there was just no way that I was going to get him settled on any other treatment or to agree to any other treatment. And I, I did discuss with him, Richard, the possibility of mitigating some of his disease and then consider nerve stimulation, but he wasn't interested in it whilst it was in clinical trial phase. Given that the AHI was 80 and significant ODI, I said, you might be screened and you might miss out, so you might be too severe for it currently uh, with the available parameters. And I, I, I guess, unlike uh, probably the one part that I might slightly disagree with, Nico, is I have had some, I guess, um, uh, patients where I've got significant mitigation of their disease with offering fairly comprehensive airway surgery, even at this level, even uh, converting them down to more mild to moderate disease in some cases. So um, although I agree with Nico, it's quite hard to predict which one at that level of disease you're going to get when you don't have favourable anatomy, and this chap doesn't have any favourable anatomy, which makes him particularly complicated. But uh, in the end, I took a... Uh, a sort of a kitchen sink approach to him and offered him transpalatal advancement, uh, pharyngoplasty along the lines of that described by Richard earlier, with tonsillectomy and modified U3P, and with midline glossectomy and lateral radiofrequency tongue, and we actually removed submucosally around uh, 14 cc's of um, tongue tissue as a part of his operation. And he came back to see me down the track for 
his, not his initial sort of post-operative visits, but for his follow-up visits when we're getting to the point of uh, repeating sleep studies. And initially when he walked through the door, he um, described improvement in symptoms. His Epworth, he scored a reduction from 18 now down to 10 and said that he was no longer snoring according to some mates on a biking trip away that he'd had two weeks prior to the consultation and the snoring severity scale therefore was scored a zero out of nine. Uh, I then sat down with him and went through the objective outcomes on his repeat sleep study. And this showed that we hadn't uh, got major, major mitigation of his disease, but we had reduced his apnea hypopnea index from 80 to 50. We had converted it to all hypopnea. We had reduced his oxygen desaturation index to 30, and we'd improved his objective sleep efficiency, which is not always a perfect measure, but from the initial preoperative sleep study of 63% to 87% on the postoperative test. I noted that he had persistent low resting oxygen saturation, and he had in fact uh, had that identified by the sleep physician who saw him initially, and he'd had a chest X-ray and spirometry performed, which didn't show any major um, or significant issues, although as I noted earlier, he'd been a, um, a previous significant smoker and his adhere oxygen saturation was 88%. So what for me uh, was um, promising a, a big improvement in snoring, which is one of the reasons he wanted treatment, uh, a big reduction in self-scored uh, sleepiness scale and shaving 30 points of AHI off, converting into hypopnea, reducing his ODI and improving his sleep efficiency. Suddenly, when I gave him the results, now that he was past the door and was processing the results that I offered to him, he became immediately miserable. He told me that during the two-week post-operative period that he didn't reveal to me whilst he was staying locally because he came from well out of town, that he felt suicidal. He locked his door to people coming to his hotel room. He didn't take any of his pain medication. He wasn't eating and drinking. And subsequent to the two-week period that he stayed in Wollongong, at about two and a half weeks, he briefly had a 24-hour hospital admission back in a hospital closer to home for dehydration. He now said to me he's disappointed that he's not cured. Uh, and I had an extensive and long discussion with him about uh, his suicidal thoughts. We first of all addressed the issue that that wouldn't be a normal response to pain, that normally, you know, we offer 24 hours a day access to myself and my registrars, and that's the whole reason he was staying locally and he had these sorts of issues, we're more than happy to look after it. We discussed his expectations and my expectations, which were in the absence of all the other preferable treatment modalities that were only really trying to mitigate disease and improve his symptoms, which we have done to a degree. Uh, we discussed all future treatments as opposed to surveillance, given that the oxygen desaturation profile or the nadir wasn't significant. Significant, And he then identified after initially saying that he felt pretty good, that he was willing to try anything but CPAP. So I don't know if anyone else wants to join in with commentary about uh, getting, I guess, not suckered into this scenario, but once you're in the scenario, you're in it. I, I think a few points that, that have been raised by uh, the, the weight loss, uh, especially when you have many hypopnias, uh, is, is a good idea to give it a try again. And indeed, you have reduced the severity uh, uh, to a very reasonable um agree of the severity now he, he might be a candidate for every uh, stem so uh, what you did is probably great and and try to 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 explain it again that, that this is not so bad this is a beginning and, and now there are other treatment options uh, available that you did not have first so, so i actually did present him jointly in a uh, joint meeting with andrew jones who's here next to me and we discussed these treatment, other treatment options as opposed to surveillance and weight loss and keeping his other risk factors under control. And at the end of that discussion, he, just, he now decided to try a mandibular advancement split, which he had outrightly rejected at the initial consultation. So the progress is I got him fitted with a mandibular advancement split and titrated. And he had further minor symptom improvement where he felt a little bit better. Uh, obviously, no change in the snoring because he's already had a significant reduction in the snoring. And there was... I just want to comment with COVID, there was a subtle delay on his repeat polysomnogram with a fitting with a jaw sphinx. What I mean by subtle was, rather than having the result two weeks or one and a half weeks uh, after his sleep study, the result took two and a half to three weeks. And just prior to receiving that result, 
the emails commenced and they were, uh, I'm upset by the whole sordid affair. I haven't been cured. I've spent this money on surgery. Why haven't I got my results? And a huge decompensation into now saying that he's got throat symptoms, even though he previously identified no complications of surgery, well-healed mucosa, no fistula from his slow advancement, uh, excellent appearances to the furrow of the posterior third of the tongue and the palate. Uh, and he described a range of potential um, reflux-type symptoms. Um, so uh, here we are again, another another step. So basically at this point, I I spoke to him after the email and said, the reason I haven't called you with your sleep study result is I don't have it yet. Uh, we'll chase it up. The reason we don't have it immediately within two weeks is it's not like receiving a blood test or radiology. It takes time to work through epochs and get accurate sleep study results. And his throat symptoms sounded a lot like reflux, so I asked him to commence anti-reflux agent, talked about vocal hygiene, excessive throat clearing, and I contacted his general practitioner by phone, um, who told me that he'd had a lot of troubles with this patient. He believes that the patient had a personality disorder. He feels that the patient was taking him, uh, as, you, as I mentioned earlier, apart from hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, has a history of anxiety and depression, he frequently took himself on and off his Cipramil antidepressants, and uh, this would generally affect his mood and the way that he perceived things. And uh, when I said to him, well, I suggested uh, that to him, he said, no. I said, I said, I think, you know, you probably need a review of your depression. He said, definitely, and I've been trying to encourage him to do that. I also said that the patient had told me he'd never had reflux previously, and the GP said, well, I've put him on and off anti-reflux agent six times in 10 years. Uh, so these symptoms had fluctuated well before any potential surgery. And so there was a range of other issues uh, going on here. And I, I, I took the careful approach and, and then chased up his sleep study result. And sure enough, there was only a further small reduction in AHI down to 40. But again, minimal to virtually no snore time noted by the tech and on the objective parameters during the sleep study. Minimal oxygen desaturation, still good sleep efficiency. And I noted that he'd gained a further four kilograms in weight. So he'd gone up from 98 kilograms to 102 kilograms. Um, and we talked about a range of other issues, including in particular uh, improving his mood and treating some of the anxiety and depression. And I focused on the fact that means of disease alleviation, we were now dealing with half potentially the level of disease that he began with, which would be potentially like wearing CPAP half the time, which he now does not have to do. And he had rejected outright due to difficulties with CPAP. So... Um, before I ask the panel again, I might ask Andrew Jones to make some comments on this type of a patient and which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Does the sleep breathing disorder make people depressed? Are they depressed to begin with? How we deal with these sort of things? And I think this is really a whole range of issues about expectations around treatment modalities outside of CPAP. Yeah, well, thanks, Stuart. Yeah, so uh, the way Stuart's going at the moment, I think he's going to turn to a sleep physician and give up surgery. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but uh, that's the first comment. But uh, no, look, I mean, they're, they're difficult patients, uh, you know, and, and they, they, as Stuart said, you know, the, the mental health issue often makes the approach difficult in the first place. I mean, they often uh, will focus on the sleep apnea and curing the sleep apnea is going to fix all their problems. And I think it's very important early on to explain that, you know, the treatment for the sleep apnea is just part of the puzzle, you know, all aspects of their health needs to be addressed to improve, you know, sleep and, and other quality of life measures uh, in relation to things. I mean, I mean, I think it's got to be very careful from a surgical viewpoint uh, uh, in really detailing this to the patient and put that understanding if you do go down the line of surgery, you know, I think probably trying to avoid it uh, as much as possible in this type of patient is, is the best thing, you know. We struggle with them as well from a... a sleep condition uh, viewpoint, you know, we often put them on sleep app as happened with this guy, he couldn't tolerate it, didn't improve symptoms, you know, he then goes to the next healthcare provider. So, you know, there's no easy answers, you know, I mean, it's a global approach and Stuart and I have, you know, for some time taking this multidisciplinary approach to this, you know, and I think probably we need to, even in our local practice, probably involve our sleep psychologists a bit more in these patients early on uh, as part of the whole picture. Does anyone else want to make any comments about? Uh, and I hope uh, I don't. I'm sorry to those that are new to the field. I obviously don't want to turn you off too much. And yeah. some of these cases are a little bit depressing. But I think it's important to understand that in the real life we face these scenarios. It's not just 
everyone walking through the door with excellent results again and again and again. And so I wanted to present four cases that were a challenge and where surgery really needs to be a, a second, third, or even further line consideration. So anyone else on the panel want to make any remarks about this last day? Well, some, some patients are, are difficult to, to satisfy. You, you did a good job. You re reduced his disease burden uh, significantly, the, the reduction of 50% of events, and now mostly hypopneas uh, in spite of uh, gain in, in, in weight. So, but you did was good. And, and at a certain point, your responsibility ends. Uh, you, you did what you could, and if he doesn't want to listen, yeah, uh, how, how can you convince him to do this? That's difficult. One of the one of the two uh, two two patients that, that stick out in my mind significantly over the last fifteen years or so, Nico, in terms of very similar looking hypnograms, very similar levels of disease, uh, was one who got an implant. Uh, yeah. and one who got surgery and ended up with a very similar result in terms of numbers. And one of those patients said, what do I need to wear a positional device for now? I feel great. I don't care about an AHI 40. That's the best thing I've ever had done. I'm going to send all of my friends here as well. And similarly, someone that we put a nerve stimulator in and converted from around 80 events an hour, although they were 65 and just slipped into the study, to about 35 events an hour and said it's a life changer, a game changer, how much better he feels. Uh, you know, for some people, you will get a similar mitigation of disease without resolving the disease, still leaving them even in the severe range, and they're absolutely glowing about the outcome and pleased. So it really is that whole concept of the disease outcomes aren't necessarily always concordant with the patient's description of symptom, in, symptomatic improvement. I think it's probably something else we should be aware of, eh? Yeah. Um, I, I might um, end, Simon, by just saying for those that are new to this field though, just um, despite some of the, those negative cases that surgery is a very important treatment and it's, it's an important second line therapy and that surgery helps patients who are affected by CPAP failure. And for those that are interested in more learning, I, I would encourage you to, to listen to this JAMA podcast that I've placed the link to there, Simon, this, this relates to the JAMA podcast and our randomised clinical trial uh, that you and I were involved in. And it's a nice, uh, it's a nice balanced podcast, uh, not only on the study, but in the broader context of the treatment of obstructive sleep apnea. So I'd encourage anyone who's interested, it only takes 18 minutes to listen to, um, uh, it gives you all of these principles in summary in, in one short session. Yep. Thanks, Stu. Um, there was also a, a chat question from someone wanting to join the um, International Surgical Sleep Society. So I'll put the website up on the chats um, if people want to join join that. Um, I'd like to thank Stuart, not just for this fantastic uh, panel he's just done, but for helping me um, being a moderator and, and basically helping pulling this all together. Uh, Stuart, I couldn't have done it without you um, and really appreciate your help and your friendship over the years. And um, thank you again to all the faculty, um, many of whom have dialed in either crazily early in the morning, Nico, or late at night for the people in America. And, you know, we've had people from Africa dialing in at two o'clock in the morning to listen to some of these talks. Um, you know, there's been a, a massive um, uh, degree of, of, of input from the, the participants as well. And thanks again to Bonnie, all the APOS staff. It, it really has been a fantastic day. So I hope you've all got something out of it. And um, Stu, there's a, another chat saying, can you put the final slide link Yep. In, the, um, in the chat box before we switch it all down. I don't know how much longer we're going to be live, probably only another 30 seconds. Yeah, I can, I can probably get one of the guys to copy and paste, but you can actually just go to JAMA and just scroll through the podcast and it's on obstructive sleep apnea. Look for Ed Livingston JAMA podcast, um, Ed Hub. It's under and you can just scroll through and go to the obstructive sleep apnea one. If you missed the link, it's all, it's all there. And I think it's for those that are interested, it's worthy of doing and, just reiterate what Simon said. Excellent job, everyone. Well organised, and not only Africa. I think Simon, as far afield as Russia, wasn't there some participants yeah. and, and 50, everywhere. Fifty different countries. Africa. Yeah. So it really has been a fantastic day. Thank you again to everyone, and hopefully we will all get a chance to meet in person at a, at the IS sometime in the future. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, you so much, guys. Have a good Thank weekend. You. See you. See you. Bye.
Bye. Bye-bye.